Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, November 29th here in New York City. This is Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Julie Hyman and Brian Sazi. Let's get right to the top three things that you need to know as the clock hits 9 a.m. Shake it off, as Taylor Swift would say. Futures looking to rebound after yesterday's slide with Asia stocks in rally mode after China reported the first decline in COVID-19 infections in more than a week. Analysts are warning that Apple will struggle to overcome the China lockdowns and the company will see a production shortfall in the coming quarters. We'll break down that report. And here in the U.S., President Biden calls on Congress to approve a labor deal that would avert a crippling national rail shutdown. But we begin today with the market action. Julie, you're at the big board. Yeah, it's a different picture from what we saw yesterday. A lot more green on the board in particular. And I want to highlight what has happened in Asia overnight, particularly with the Hong Kong Hang Seng, which tracks Chinese shares traded in Hong Kong, among other things. And you're looking at the one month chart here. If you look at the action on the day, we saw a 5% bump up. And the Hang Seng actually looking at its best month going back to 2003, up 22% on the month. And this, even with the protests over the last few days notwithstanding, the optimism has been in place over the past month or so that there was going to be a reopening with China releasing its 20-point plan for that reopening. So that's what has been driving the action. If you get on over here to the United States, you'll see the futures are are not necessarily indicating a strongly higher open, but S&P futures right now are little changed, but still, again, a bit of a different picture that we are watching from yesterday. That is also evidence when you look at crude oil futures, which rebounded over the course of the day yesterday and now remain in the green today. And a quick check as well, if we can find them on what's going on with Chinese shares. Here we have them, Chinese ADRs that trade here in the U.S. And if you look at how they are trading in pre-market trading, JD.com up 6.5%, BABA up 5.3%, Pinduoduo up uh, 5% as well. So a big rebound from some of the weakness that was happening yesterday. Indeed, worth calling it out to Alibaba, top trending ticker on the Yahoo Finance platform, seeing a big move here in the pre-market, as Julie just mentioned. All right, this market action happening after China's top health officials pledged a new push to speed up COVID-19 shots for the elderly. Officials announced this in their first press briefing since protests erupted across China against the country's lockdown restrictions. For more, let's bring in uh, Yahoo Finance senior healthcare reporter Anjali Kamlani. Anjali. That's right, Brian. So we know that, of course, China has been facing a lot of pressure because of that recent spike in COVID cases. But as Julie just recently said, uh, they did see the first reduction in a week. But now what's happening is that China is faced with deciding what to do moving forward. They were asked today uh, whether or not they plan on easing the COVID restrictions. That's very uh, strict zero COVID policy. No response there. Meanwhile, focusing on vaccinations instead, especially of the elderly. Now, That has been a struggle. While much of the world has focused on the elderly uh, population, China has had a lot of hesitancy and faced a lot of struggle in getting that population vaccinated due to a dearth of information on the uh, vaccine itself, that homegrown vaccine uh, supply that they're using, rather than the Pfizer Moderna that we know is available elsewhere. So uh, they're currently facing that issue. They have said that they've increased since uh, the beginning half of the year when it was just about 50% of those 80 and older. Now they're nearing uh, 70, 80%. So that's a big push uh, in the, uh, sorry, closer to 90% for the uh, initial boost, uh, initial doses. And then they're slowly increasing on the boosters. And that's uh, where they're uh, even reducing the timeline for that, saying that uh, boosters can be given after three months of the initial doses. And that's a shorter timeline that we, we've seen globally. But that's uh, in order to push more protection on that elderly population that they say is the reason why that zero COVID policy is still in place. Especially around this time of year, medical professionals are warning around a a triple demic, Mm -hmm. particularly. But for what we know around COVID right now, in this go round, what are the transmissibility rates that we've seen? What, what's even the mortality that we've seen in this most recent variant? So recently, the transmissibility has been higher. That's okay. really where the concern is coming from, right? We know that these Omicron subvariants are quickly spreading, and there are very uh, much more of them rather than those like waves of just one variant at a time that we saw earlier in the pandemic. So that's what's actually causing more concern. And the one that's affecting China right now, or you know, it has been sequenced more in China right now, is one of the more transmissible ones to the point of look at what happened at Shanghai Disney, right? Uh, They were open. This is the fourth time they've had to shut down because of the COVID policies, Uh, even though much of the resort, the hotels are still open, but the park itself has had to close down just four days after reopening 
from their last lockdown uh, because of a, a positive test. So that's really, you know, the situation that they're facing is just a, an uncertainty around all of the, the variants right now. Yahoo Finance's own Anjali Kamani breaking this all down for us. Thanks so much, Anj. And for more on what's happening in China, let's bring in Yale University senior fellow and author of Accidental Conflict, Stephen Roach. Stephen, great to have you here with us this morning. When you think about what is taking place in China with regard to its own policy and, and what they're trying to combat, as well as the rest of the world at a time of the year when we do see these spikes in COVID cases, you know, how does this have a broader economic impact that we should also be paying close attention to? Well, first of all, um, this this zero COVID policy it itself is an unmitigated disaster. It was designed to cope with the original Wuhan strain of a very lethal uh, virus, and um, as was just pointed out, it's it, it's really the wrong approach to deal with the um, less lethal but more transmissible variants associated with. Um, uh, Omicron, but you know, autocrats don't ever like to uh, admit they were wrong. And uh, Xi Jinping is uh, the quintessential uh, uh, autocrat in in that regard. And so, you know, he's he's not backing down. There will be ongoing impacts uh, on the economy. Uh, the numbers I saw overnight suggest that uh, the, the current wave of lockdowns is now impacting areas that account for about 25% of Chinese GDP, which is um, now markedly higher than the 21% impact of last uh, April during that uh, uh, Shanghai-focused uh, lockdown. So, you know, this is a big consequence for near-term Chinese growth prospects with knock-on effects around the world. Stephen, it's Julie here. Um Part of what you examine in your book is false narratives that China has about the U.S., that the U.S. has about China. So as we look at the unfolding protests that are happening in China, how do we view that um, with a sort of unbiased eye and try to get at what the real effect, if any, will be in China politically? Well, the, um, the, the accounts that you read in the Western press overnight are a classic example of the false narratives that the West clings to in assessing uh, uh, China risks. Virtually every article that I've looked at in the past couple of days draws a direct line to uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989. Yet when you think about what triggered uh, the student uprising uh, back then, it was the, the death of Hu Yaobang, uh, a former leader who was very pro-reform, who was uh, sort of personified the spirit that a younger generation was captivated by. Uh, there, there is no political uh, figure that stands in opposition to Xi Jinping right now that is um, sort of a lightning rod in this debate. He took care of any political opposition uh, in the recently concluded uh, 20th Party Congress. So uh, the comparisons that you know, uh, we're, we're hearing about 1989 are a classic example of the false narratives that I write about in this book. Stephen, what does a reopening timeline for the Ch Chinese economy look like next year? Well, we don't know. Again, you know, it's sort of like what, what we went through in uh, 2020. Uh, we locked down too. Uh, and um, uh, we said during the time that, that uh, the, the reopening would be driven by um, the spread of the disease uh, itself. And so uh, that that's what allowed us to uh, uh, enjoy a, an extraordinary snapback after an uh, even more extraordinary downturn in early uh, 2020. So uh, it, it's hard to know how uh, this Omicron is going to progress uh, in China. Uh, I'm not an epidemiologist, but we're all sort of you know, picked up some skills in that regard. And, um, you know, it's a very transmissible uh, disease and, and their vaccines are lousy vaccines. Uh, they don't have the, uh, the efficacy of the mRNA that we have here. And uh, the, the, the lack of um, vaccinations for the elderly, it, it may be picking up a little bit, but it's still not at a level that, that makes them uh, comfortable. But, you know, this is a, 
very transmissible disease. I, I finally got it myself three weeks ago. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that uh, there, there's more to come with respect to that in China. I certainly hope that you're fully recovering as well in that process. Uh, we do know that this impacts a range of different industries from healthcare in China, from all the way to technology here in the U.S. as well on some of the production fronts. And so how do you believe that this latest wave of COVID cases in China is also impacting perhaps some of the sentiment of U.S.-based companies and even how they're engaging with citizens in China at this point in time through some of the technology there? Well, look, I, I think a lot of multinationals, um, uh, U.S. Uh, and uh, European-based, have made massive uh, concentration bets on China as a low-cost, highly efficient uh, offshore production platform. And I think they're in the process of, of rethinking and hedging out uh, some of those risks, not just because of COVID, but because of the U.S.-China conflict, uh, China's uh, sort of uh, belligerence in the um, uh, uh, in dealing with geo uh, strategic issues, especially its new, quote, unlimited partnership with uh, Russia, the pariah of the world. So, uh, you know, the best bellwether, uh, bellwether of this is Apple, uh, who um, uh, has been uh, for years 100 percent focused on uh, the offshore production of, of Foxconn uh, in Guangdong province and is now diversifying uh, and actually making, starting to make a few iPhones in uh, uh, India. And I think um, you'll see more of that uh, in the years ahead. You can't put all your eggs in one Chinese basket anymore. Um, Stephen, to zoom out a little bit on the U.S.-China relationship, we recently, of course, had President Biden shaking hands with President Xi um, and sort of symbolically agreeing to continue talking, right? Um, and I'm just curious where you see the relationship going over the next, say, decade and what the implications are for both nations economically. I know that's a big question. <laughs> well, it's a big question, but I just, you know, I just wrote a book about it. And, um, you know, my view is that um, the relationship is in terrible shape. The Bali summit was, you know, long on words and photo ops, but it, it accomplished nothing. The tariffs are still in place. Uh, the technology battles over advanced semiconductor chips are intensifying. And, you know, we dodged uh, a proverbial bullet in Taiwan uh, last August, but uh, the presumptive um, Speaker of the House, uh, Kevin McCarthy, has promised to go to Taiwan uh, very early on after he takes over uh, as the, uh, the next uh, leader of, of the House, third in line to the U.S. presidency. We'll see how China uh, takes that. And so I, I'm very worried about the conflict. I think the approach that we've used to engage China is has not worked at all. Uh, and I write about uh, a three-part plan in my own book that uh, is a very different approach to hopefully getting us on a more constructive path. But, you know, unfortunately right now, there's no uh, support anywhere uh, in the U.S. Congress or in the executive branch for a more constructive relationship with China. And we've got to uh, uh, address that before we can even uh, start to think about uh, a more constructive outcome. Obviously, for the full details, people have to pick up the book, Accidental Conflict, America, China, and the Clash of False Narratives. Yale University Senior Fellow Stephen Roach. Thanks for being here, Stephen. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, Stephen alluded to Apple diversifying its iPhone fabrication. This morning, uh, Evercore uh, is revising its iPhone revenue estimates to reflect the impact that these headwinds in China will have on Apple. The firm lowered its December quarter iPhone revenue estimate by $8 billion, but increased it for the March and June quarters. And that reflects, guys, what we've been seeing broadly from the analyst community, which is that they expect this to be a short-term hiccup for Apple, and then it's going to they say make up uh, when we do get the eventual reopening, they're going to make up for that production. Yeah, but you're still seeing, it is amazing to see uh, this estimate cut. You saw Dan Ives or Wedbush yesterday cut his estimates, and you still see Apple shares 24 times forward earnings, price for perfection. Uh, the stock remains trading uh, high, at a higher market multiple. 
just on the assumption that Apple's a defensive stock, but I think you see news like this and you realize maybe it's not as defensive as you would think. Now, the second thing here worth noting from this note is that the problems in China might cause Apple to diversify uh, away from China in terms of making its phones, according to Evercore. That might have them looking at India, Vietnam, and other parts of the Asia-Pacific region. The problem with that, that might raise Apple's costs mm. and impact their profit margins. Well, what they're pointing to in this note as well is the Zhengzhou site. And particularly, this is known, as, as they have kind of pointed out within this, as iPhone City. And so for that production that Apple has relied on now for years here, they're estimating now from Evercore that the, the site accounts for about 75% of global iPhone shipments. And this time around, the production was heavily skewed to the higher end models, Pro and Pro Max. Now, what we've continuously heard is that there is more demand for the higher end iPhone models, at least in this go round. But the larger question is, even if you do have, and to Wed Bush's point yesterday, even if you do have some of the, the backlog, perhaps, in ability to actually produce any of the iPhone models, then it comes back to, okay, all right, where does some of the demand dynamics get thrown off if you're now pushing out that cycle a little bit further more uh, as well? And so I, I think that particularly within how they're reliant on that Zhengzhou site uh, dynamics, that could potentially throw off some of the ability to produce and then at least meet some of that demand that they're seeing right now uh, this holiday season. And P.S., you're questioning whether iPhone, Apple's still defensive. Evercore thinks it's still defensive. Mm -hmm. They still have an outperform yeah, rating on the stock. They might be revising mm -hmm. the revenue forecast, but it just pushes it off. It doesn't eliminate. Like, those right, iPhones I, are still going to get made. A downgrade on Apple is such a rarity on the street. Uh, and, and it's just remarkable. I think, I, sure, I mean, it's Apple. They have this service revenue. But still, here's something fundamentally changing in this story, and the street is not moving on it. You have to wonder what would take this stock down. Well, it's if they miss a critical holiday season cycle, too, mm -hmm. because there are so many people that are looking across the different options for, it's really just a, a camera that you're carrying around in your pocket at these days. And Google has run away with some of the best dynamics for the camera phone or the smartphone, but for Apple, the ecosystem that they still have, if they miss out on a critical holiday season where even at some of the higher end models, if you do have an affluent consumer that is still willing to spend on that higher end model, if you miss out on that holiday season, then what does that mean in terms of messing up the broader cycle? And, and I, we've talked about that with, with Dan Ives before, just about where the super cycle even stands or goes forward I, from here. I love how Dan called it on the show yesterday. This situation is like a gut punch to Apple. I would take it as a, a punch in the face just to counter Dan's argument there. Mike Tyson that's said a, had that's a, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. There's one underperform on Apple, by the way, from Itao, the uh, Brazilian bank. Hmm. And we'll be covering more about Apple's production outlook later in the show with Oppenheimer analyst Martin Yang. We'll have to see what he has to say about this. Um, he has an outperformance stock also. Coming up, President Biden is urging Congress to block the looming rail strike to ratify a deal between railroads and the union. We'll have the details next.
President Biden is demanding Congress take action to avoid a looming rail shutdown that he says would devastate the U.S. economy. For more, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Rick, what's the latest on this that we know so far? Uh, right. As you pointed out, uh, they, it looks like they cannot come to an agreement uh, of the 12 unions. Several have said they're not going to sign it. And if, and if one of them says they're not going to sign it, they will all uh, not sign in solidarity. Um, Congress has the authority to step in here because rail workers historically are, are considered essential to the functioning of the U.S. economy. And I, I think that <laughs> remains true. Forty percent of all freight travels by rail. We just been through devastating supply chain problems coming out of COVID. Those are finally getting uh, wrinkled, uh, ironed out. So this is the wrong time <laughs> to have a rail strike that messes everything up again. So uh, if they cannot come to an agreement, the deadline is now December 9th. Um, and if they can't come to agreement, Congress has the authority to step in and say they can do a number of things to resolve it. They can say uh, this deal that's on the table, we're ordering everybody, both sides, to accept the deal. They can uh, refer to other arbitrators. They can delay it till a further date. Um, so they can do any of those things. But the odds are that if it comes to this, that Congress will actually do this quickly. Um, because this is not really political. No, neither party, neither Democrats or Republicans, I think, sees anything to gain from, uh, from not getting this uh, over with um, so that we can just move on to the other political fights that well, both parties want to have. But at the same time, while Biden in his statement says over and over again, I'm pro-union, you know, I'm a supporter of unions, the unions would be not terribly happy if Congress forced them to accept the deal. I mean, I think the sticking point seems to be sick leave, right? right. That they're, they don't have paid sick leave? They don't have enough paid sick leave. Yeah. And um, the unions argue that this actually forces people to go to work when they're, when they're sick. Right. Um, because the, the system does n is just inflexible and it does n not allow them um, what, what, what I think a lot of us would consider to be genuine sick time. And there's some other work-life balance issues there. It's not pay. Um, they, they actually seem to be okay with the pay package. Um, but uh, so Biden is not facing an imminent election. Let's keep that in mind. A month ago, he was facing the midterm elections. That's not an issue right now. Um, so I think the most important thing to Biden politically, even more important than uh, the appearance of a pro-union stance, is keep this economy moving. Do not, uh, do not let, let anything happen that's going to mess up the economy, which is actually kind of fragile right now. I mean, growth is clearly slowing. Uh, a lot of economists are saying uh, we're headed for a recession in 2023. And uh, this would be the kind of thing, if we do have a rail strike that disrupts shipping, that would be uh, the kind of thing that makes everything worse at a very fragile moment. Rick, at least it'd be, uh, it would be deflationary, right? Uh, no, no, it wouldn't because we because suddenly you can't. We're just starting to see goods inflation come down. We're seeing disinflation in goods, and and we're going to see deflation if suddenly you can't get the goods. That we go back to where we were before. Good point, Rick Newman. Thanks so much. Bye Appreciate guys. it. Straight ahead, we'll have the opening bell on Wall Street as markets try to stabilize after Monday's pounding. UPS also catching up. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. While we await the opening bell on Wall Street, let's hit a few hot tickers on the Yahoo Finance platform. We're watching UPS this morning following an upgrade from Deutsche Bank as they now view the stock as a buy. They also raised the t- price target on the stock to $220 from $197. Guys, uh, really a two-part note here by Amit Mahatra over at Deutsche Bank. One, he says the near-term investors are perhaps too focused on any potential volume misses because of the economic slowdown. And then two, longer term, he likes what the company is doing operationally under CEO Carol, uh, Carol Tomei, just operating a more efficient business. Yeah, they said the bottom line here is that UPS shares, uh, it appears to them as over-indexing transitory headwinds, they're calling rather than or saying against some of the structural opportunity for consistent profitable growth. And so what we've seen is kind of uh, a divergence now between how the street is looking at a FedEx versus a UPS. And for UPS, being able to, even in the current environment right now, as um, this by by thesis has stated, um, even within this environment, stewarding the necessary kind of changes right now to make sure that they are not only delivering at a time where they know that some of the volumes could fluctuate here, not just among the end consumers who are trying to figure out, okay, do we have the ability to spend the same level that we did mid-pandemic? And for FedEx, for UPS, that's where kind of that divergence takes place. And it really also comes down to how many end businesses that you're going to continue to engage with. And for a lot of those businesses, they've just passed that cost through to consumers as well. Yeah, one minor red flag I will note here, UPS is a key labor union contract up for renewal next year, covering a large part of employees. If I have it right, UPS has not seen a strike in over 25 years, so that is something to watch out for. Now, people familiar with the matter have told me that they expect to get this deal done and relatively quickly, but again, something to watch. Yeah, this, I mean, Marotra doesn't seem concerned about yes. the strike. He thinks it'll be more benign than, than expected. I mean, you have a lot of contrarian calls. This is quite a contrarian call, right? It's And it's kind of interesting how he looks at the history and says that the other times when it was at these levels. Mm-hmm. It was is when it ended up doing big well. difference so versus, we'll versus FedEx. I mean, the the sentiment on UPS for, versus FedEx headed into next year couldn't be more different. Well, yeah. in theory, that's when it's time to buy. Is what he's arguing. <laughs> so we'll see if he's right. Um, let's take a look at the futures here as we're getting ready for the opening bell here on this Tuesday morning, um, because we are seeing not a lot of movement here. Sort of a waiting game as investors are watching the situation unfold in China, talking about the implications of that. We have seen a rebound, certainly in Chinese shares, in oil prices, for example. Uh, so we'll see what that all means. Also, we've this is the time of year when we get all the outlook notes uh, for Wall Street. We're going to talk more about those later in the show, but we'll get kind of a, a good read on sentiment and what people are talking about. So there's the opening bell on this Tuesday with that mixed open that we have been watching for um, is now going on. There it is. There it is. Like every day at 9.30. <laughs> we did it that's again. A, that's all you got? That's all I got today. I thought you were going to have some, some no, opening bell. insight for us. No, SP funds. I don't really know anything about them. Uh, apparently, it is um, a new ETF. Cool. Okay. All Let's right. take it on over to Brad then. It looks like you're starting with some of the China names. No, uh, no, I'm going to just toggle over to the okay, major let's, let's averages go somewhere here. Else. In the name of SP Funds, let's take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average here on the day. They're down by about two tenths of a percent uh, for the Dow. We'll put that on a two-day view here just to give you a look at where we've had some of the activity kind of kick off this week as well. The Nasdaq Composite, you're seeing that flat just barely to the upside right now. That's carrying some losses over the past two days, down by about one and a half percent. We'll see what we can do to kind of claw back some of those declines. And then additionally here, the the S&P 500, you're seeing that flat just barely to the downside as well out of the gate here this morning. Let's take a look at some of the sector activity, though, that we're seeing here on the day. On our Wi-Fi Interactive, we've got a handy-dandy look at the 11 S&P 500 sectors. We're relatively split, or about as split as you could get for 11 sectors here. It looks like more advancers than decliners, though, as of right now. It looks like energy is leading the charge right now. That's up by about 1.7 percent. However, utilities bringing up the caboose, that's down by about 1 percent here out of the gate on the day here. And then just just lastly, let's ride out with a view of the NASDAQ 100 as well, just to see exactly where things are trending right now as we are on this Giving Tuesday. Perhaps you're feeling uh, charitable out there, folks, but uh, some of the major averages as well, uh, they are feeling, uh, or some of the major movers here on the NASDAQ 100, they are feeling a little bit too charitable, giving back some of their gains that they've seen as well here. So, Yeah, I guess so. All right, thanks so much. And now we're going to look at one stock that is 
Giving up gains and then some. It's off 11%. That's Hibbit Sports. Uh, following a third quarter earnings miss on both the top and bottom lines, the sporting goods company also reported a 56.4% increase in its inventory compared to the prior year. I think that might take the prize, the dubious prize, of being mm -hmm. the biggest the increase award? in inventory. Yeah, of those that of the companies that we've talked about, right? I think that's the biggest increase that we have seen. Just lose track after a while, Julie. All these double-digit increases after yeah. a while all look the same, but not a really good quarter for for Hibbit. Uh, margins under pressure in large part because of higher uh, expenses to get products to the consumer. Really, and you know, we were just talking about the difference between UPS and FedEx. Look at this quarter from Hibbit compared to what we saw from Dick's Sporting Goods last week, night and day. And I think that really. It shows the scale of Dick's Sporting Goods uh, and their ability to not only spread higher costs over more stores, but just to get better product than a regional player like Hibbon. They did talk about a strong back to school season. That is something that we heard about from Dick's as well here. But then additionally, you think about what's taking place perhaps in the current quarter. We're also coming off of a heavy spending weekend for both Black Friday and then some of the Cyber Monday results coming in. And it was interesting on some of the Adobe data that had come in. Sporting goods sales actually surged 239% uh, this past weekend compared with average daily sales in October. Uh, I wish we would get a year over year number on that because I mean, just uh, October, what, 7th? I just, sent him a text. I just sent him a text. Yeah, it. please do. Yeah, right. Just yeah, get you know, some that is a weird, that. a weird comparison metric. Yeah. So perhaps Hibbit Sports, um, which I was looking at some of the drops that are coming out on Hibbit Sports online. They got the 7-Eleven Crocs. Perhaps that'll- uh, Did you get a pair? I, I didn't buy a pair, yeah, no. They're coming out today, though. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. What do you like? What do you think when you see somebody walking down the street in a pair of 7-Eleven Crocs? They I think it's just billboards, Julie. I think it's billboards for the brand. They shouldn't be worn. I, I, I think they can be worn, but I think 7-Eleven should be paying those people. I don't think people should be paying for the shoes. <laughs> You're yes. wearing ads yes. on your sh You're on your welcome. feet. Yes. Um, <laughs> and they did say, by the way, in the quarter that footwear did well. Yes. It was apparel where they had some issues, so they'll be. Selling lots of those 7-Eleven Crocs, we'll I see imagine. if the drops pay off there. Yeah. Let's also take a look at shares of Darden Restaurants. Ticker symbol DRI this morning, following a downgrade to neutral by Baird, citing that the risk and reward looks more balanced. Baird did, however, raise its price target on Darden to $150. That's up from $134, as they believe that DRI is on track to deliver good results in the second and third quarters here. Now, some of the backdrop here is pretty interesting, and I was taking a look at some of the stats from the National Restaurant Association. And even though you saw eating and drinking places for the most recent month where we saw data come in, post total sales of $89.5 billion, uh, which was up 1.6% sequentially, you still have total dollar spending in restaurants increasing in recent months. However, that's due to rising menu prices. It's not just because people are going into these experiences and saying, yeah, we want to spend more at you know, Red Lobster or I want to get endless salad and breadsticks at Olive Garden. The prices are just higher. It, they are just higher. And I'm on the, uh, I was looking at the menu uh, by me for, for Olive Garden. Spaghetti with meatballs. Almost 1,000 calories, $16.78. So two of those, 40 bucks after tax. You're now looking at almost, what, a $60 night out with no drinks? At the Olive Garden. At the Olive Garden. That is a big, I think, just shift. I mean, we remember going to Olive Garden back in high school. This place was dirt cheap. Grab your salad, grab your food, 15 bucks, you're out the door. But, I mean, it's changed because of inflation. It's a total different model. Yeah. You like Olive Garden? What? You're not an Olive Garden fan? I mean, I haven't been to an Olive Garden in 25 years. Hmm, interesting. So to Italy. That's I liked it when I, I was in college. There yeah, you go. It was good. Well, they'll report earnings That's next true, week, yes. so I'm very curious on how those same source sales play out. All right, we're going to see. Guys, coming up, Yahoo Finance's Jared Blick, we're going to break down the latest market action as investors look ahead to more economic data to come. He's a big lasagna fan. We'll hear from him next.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live this morning, everyone. Taking a look at major averages. They are mixed right now with the NASDAQ as the lone laggard flat, just barely to the downside. For more on today's tape, let's get on over to the Wi-Fi Interactive. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery, standing by. Hey, Jared. Yes, a, lot of, a whole lot of nothing going on so far. We don't really have much movement in the majors. Uh, I want to take a little bit of a longer term view, kind of rewind it to what I said 24 hours ago, which was we were selling off from the 200 day moving average. That line would be right about there. This is a three month chart of the S&P 500. So this is the benchmark that a lot of people are watching. And the fact that it's selling off of a key technical level once again, and it's done this many times or several times this year, I should say, uh, is something that a lot of investors are paying attention to. At the same time, the U.S. dollar index is bouncing off of its 200-day uh, moving average. This is a key technical indicator that currency people are watching. And so if the U.S. dollar strengthens from here, that's a big headwind for stocks and risk markets. And of course, traders are looking forward to potentially some tailwinds uh, from the season that we have upcoming here in December, the Santa Claus rally, uh, potentially capping the end of the year in the first couple of days of the new year. Uh, but I'll show you another thing, the 13-week T bill yield, that is up another nine basis points today. That is at 4.28%. And you take a look at the 52-week range. Uh, don't forget, at the beginning of the year, it was sitting at two basis points. That's 0.02. For it to have come this far is an incredible deal. Um, and uh, the fact that we're not sinking even more, in spite of the fact today that we are seeing that huge surge in uh, Fed-induced interest rates is actually something to consider. Energy in the forefront, that's after being uh, one of the worst sectors yesterday. Crude oil falling before, below $74, $73 per barrel. First time that we've seen that in a year. That is in the forefront, followed by materials, industrials, real estate, financials, consumer discretionary. Uh, con communication services also outperforming just a little bit. But as I said at the beginning of the segment, not seeing a lot of outsized movement just yet. It's the defensive sectors here, utility staples and healthcare that are in the red, but throw tech in there as well. So let's round out the discussion by looking at the NASDAQ. And you see most of the mega caps under a bit of pressure here. Tesla up half a percent, Meta up one and a half percent. And some of the green spots, some of the dark green spots, those are focused around our Chinese stocks. And let's just take a two-day look at some of these gains here. Pretty impressive to see this going on in spite of the general market weakness. Guys. Yeah, good call out on uh, Meta. Brad mentioned a little while ago, but you see those gains strengthening here in the early going. Jared Blickery, thanks so much. All right, crude oil may now be down slightly for the year as Julie's, uh, Julie discussed in today's amazing morning brief newsletter, but the 10 largest stocks in the energy sector are all still up at least 50% year-to-date, points out Bespoke. The largest year-to-date year -date gains belong to Marathon Petroleum with a 100% increase, and Warren Buffett favorite Occidental with a 144% gain. Coming up, we'll speak with an analyst from Deutsche Bank on his 2023 outlook. That's on the other side of the break.
as we approach the end of the year, let's take a look ahead to where the market and the economy might be heading in 2023. Deutsche Bank is calling for a dip in U.S. GDP going into the first two quarters of 2023 before recovery. Here to talk about this prediction and more is Deepak Thury, who is Deutsche Bank's International Private Bank, America's CIO. Deepak, thank you for being here. So you all seem to be in the recession camp, two quarters of a contraction before a recovery. Um, kind of set the stage for us, if you will. Do you think it is going to be the Fed that is the thing on which the recession hinges? Good morning, Julie. Great to be with you. Uh, so, you know, first couple of things, uh, the recession is a mild one. Uh, so you look at uh, the definition of a recession from National Bureau of Economic Research, right? The four Ds, the debt duration, deceleration, um, and uh, the diversification. And I think what we're going to see is a, a mild recession. And, and this is something the Fed has already talked about. Uh, the lagged effect of the cumulative actions that they have taken this year, which have been severe by any measure, right? Very aggressive. We are almost at 4%. Um, more likely, our base case is another 125 basis points of rate tightening. Um, you know, that would have an impact. Historically, you have seen GDP contract uh, with that kind of a rate hike. Uh, same goes for, you know, labor pains. We haven't seen that yet, but our expectation is that starting the first quarter of next year, we start to see this uh, milder trajectory uh, a little bit different than what we've been uh, used to over the last couple of months, I would say. Deepak, even in a mild recession, is there anything that would cause the, ped, the, the Fed excuse me, to pause its, its rate policy? Yeah, you know, they have uh, telegraphed it well. Uh, and I think uh, the two things that they are looking for is, A, the sequential decline in the inflation print. And we started uh, with the 7.7 .7 October number. That's a great start. So we need some of a few of those to happen uh, Brad, before we at least fulfilled that criteria. And the second one would be the stability in the inflation expectations, the long-term inflation expectations, which have started to also be well anchored. So I think those two are there. But the third, the not much uh, telegraphed, is really the Fed would like to see some uh, labor market softness. And that's why I think the, this week's uh, non-farm payroll numbers on Friday takes exaggerated importance. But in general, you know, the Fed is looking at inflation as they always do. But also they would like to see a little bit of softness in labor markets. They want to see the jolts number become a little bit more from a historical perspective, you know, less, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the people People looking for jobs. Uh, same goes for the ADP reports. So you're going to see a number of uh, labor market statistics that could have an influence on the Fed measures. But as of today, at least uh, we don't see uh, that changing substantially over the next uh, few months. So the Fed pause, which the market might be looking for, you know, might be a little bit delayed. Uh, but it's not. It's, it, it is going to happen most likely in the first half of 2023. Deepak, within your uh, call for a recession, uh, how many jobs is the economy creating each month? Well, in that particular scenario, you know, we've been used to 350,000 plus job gains over the last 12 months. We're still expecting 200,000, you know, uh, headline gains this uh, Friday. Uh, you are looking at a sub 100K, uh, you know, job gains. That would be enough to actually start looking at a little bit of a a decline or an uptick in the uh, U3, in the unemployment rate. And, uh, you know, in, in the past recessions, in the mild ones, uh, even 50K to 100K tends to be the norm. Uh, and, and I would say that would be the norm this time around as well. But you also want to see it, you know, U6 number, the underemployment number. You want to see the seasonal hiring, which would be a good sort of a barometer as a precursor to what could happen to full-time employment. And then uh, average hourly earnings. You know, the wage inflation is a key criteria for the Fed to look at. Uh, I think if you start seeing downward pressure on AHE, that would also mean that uh, the overall expenditure that's going on into the labor market is going down, which would be something, it's perverse way of saying, but it will be welcome news for the Fed at this point. And Deepak, let's put this all into your outlook for U.S. equities. Um, you know, the conventional wisdom is that you do see stocks bottom before the recession, right? Um, and no. That said, it's not as though you're expecting things to go off to the races. I believe your year-end target for next year for the S&P 500 is only 4,100. So, you know, kind of, I guess a little bit of a gain, but, you know, not much of one. 
That's correct, Julie. I mean, you know, the mild recession sort of puts a tab on uh, on the uh, on the very strong. Uh, uptake in equity markets that one would recommend. You know, also that Fed is not done with its hiking cycle. You know, the Fed speak recently has sort of communicated that to the market in various forms that, you know, don't expect a much lenient Fed going forward, uh, at least as long as those criteria that I was talking about are fulfilled. I think when you zoom out, the risky assets are a little bit better placed right now than maybe a year ago or maybe at the start of this year. First, you know, the markets are getting used to higher rates, which is a, a very psychological difference than when you first give the shock of a rate hike to the markets. So A, markets getting used. Secondly, the market expectations in the Fed guidance are aligned to a large extent, which is a departure from what we had uh, in the first half of this year, where every subsequent Fed speak was a little bit of a, you know, dislocated with the market expectations were, I think that trend really changed in the Jackson Hole Summit. So today, the market expectations with regards to rates and the Fed guidance is, uh, in terms of their base case scenario, is a little bit more in line. And I think those two things gives us the uh, impetus to put a, a higher number than where we are today. But the fact that we are going to be uh, he heading into a mild recession would keep a lid on this um, you know, upward trajectory. Deepak, good to see you. Thanks so much for sharing your outlook with us. Deepak Fury is Deutsche Bank's International Private Bank, a CIO of the Americas. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, Cyber Monday spending hit record levels yesterday. Saz is back hmm, with his controversial take on one top retailer. That's next. Well, Cyber Monday spending, spending hit a record, topping $11.3 billion. That's from Adobe data, showing that consumers are still shopping despite record inflation, or maybe they're just paying more for stuff. One thing people hit buy on was the Lululemon belt bag. It sold out once again on Black Friday. That item, hot item is where we find Sazi's steak. And we also find it on Sazi. He borrowed yeah. my belt bag 
for this segment, which I was lucky enough to get, I don't know, quite a while ago. So. I will say it's a real honor to wear your vintage Lululemon doll bag, Julie. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. You know, it's uh, you know, I'm glad we're friends. All right, but look, this uh, analysis comes from our uh, other friend, Simeon Siegel, uh, over at BMO Capital Markets, out with a note this morning talking about these belt bags here uh, that Lululemon is selling on its site, $58 to $78. Uh, and Simeon is saying, and you can see in the Google search data right there, first, the Google searches for belt bags has been absolutely robust in November. This remains a very high, uh, hot item. And as Simeon noted, has been out of stock pretty much throughout the year. You can see it right there on the screen. That is the modern day belt bag, a little more, a little different than the, uh, the one that Julie has here uh, that I am wearing. But still, Simeon Siegel saying uh, Lululemon got the inventory for this bag back in the stores, high margin product, and it looks like uh, those products sold out very nicely for the holiday season. Now, Simeon is adding uh, this might be a good uh, indication on what Lululemon might report uh, in terms of earnings when they announce results later this week. Strong sales of belt bags plus strong traffic, Simeon talks about, really throughout Black Friday weekend might mean good things in terms of Lululemon's quarter, but also more importantly when it comes to a stock price for perfection like this, more importantly their outlook. So Simeon is looking for a good outlook from the company as well, whether that leads to a, a higher stock price, to be determined, as I mentioned, this probably is one of the most expensive stocks in all of the retail sector right now, which leads me to my take. And I, and I get these belt bags are cool. I, I happen to, oh, look, we, oh, hey, yes. we all have belt, belt bags. bags for wow, just a little bit, just like absolutely fab. But look, these modern day fanny packs, as you can see right here, and that's what they are, fanny packs, just with great or improved marketing for the modern age. Uh, they are likely to just not be popular at some point next year. And Julie's not liking You're that so take. You're so wrong. But, but. You are so wrong about that. I mean, well, uh, hold on. In addition to those uh, belt bags, uh, the stock at some point is probably to come back down to earth as Lululemon cycles uh, tough the sales. The stock's patterns. already come down. Now, let me add this, Julie. We are lobby looking at an environment next year where many more people are back in the office. Do we need this bag in our office life? Yes. Yes. Why? Don't we need a backpack again as we go into people the office? People are still going to be wearing these. Really? Yes. Okay. Fanny packs. Definitely. Fanny pack. Why can't we call them fanny packs? And P.S. Packs? If you can't get one of these, I also have a Dagny Dover fanny mm -hmm. pack. Not quite as useful. It doesn't have as many little compartments, mm -hmm. but it looks cool. So I really like this. There green. are options. You I don't. Like, is this green? out there. It's a. It's I would like call it an aqua. Green? I would call it an aqua. Uh, if you can't, it. if you can't <laughs> find this belt bag, there are other belt bags out there, people, for you to buy for your loved ones for what's, the holidays. What's the difference between the belt bags and the satchels? Maybe that's that's. It's all, a satchel is a backpack. That's all the same. That's a backpack. A satchel is a backpack or a book bag. I don't have one. I'm not cool enough to rock that. A satchel is a book bag. A belt bag or a fanny pack is okay. that. What are you putting in this? I'm not going through your bag. My phone. Probably speaking. Money. Money. Your your card Lipstick. to get into the building. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't serve a purpose. It's but quite I, useful. Interesting. Yes, your backpack. You got to take it over. You got to go. Are you trying to buy another this one? This is right of these. there. How many of these do you have? Just one. I have one of this brand, mm -hmm. and I have one of the Dagny Dover. Well, they're back in stock at Lululemon. Seventy-eight bucks, Julie. Time Are they in time stock? Time to get a new one. Time I think that's one. fake news. All right, we're going to check out the stores. Guys, coming up, we're back with some of the breaking economic data on how consumers are viewing the economy and the belt bags. Next. <laughs>
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm Brian Sazi alongside Julie Hyman and Brad Smith. Markets looking to stabilize a bit after Monday's downdraft, but we have seen the Dow now turn into the red. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ are clinging to gains. But Julie, over to you. Some breaking news on the Consumer Confidence Board. Yeah, Consumer Confidence from the Conference Board coming in at 100.2. 100.2, that is a decline from the 102.5 that was recorded in October. It is two-tenths of a point better than estimated, so not much different here um, on that front. Um, but, you know, showing that confidence is not collapsing, right, but it is weakening to some extent, which is not surprising given some of the other economic data that we have been getting. Um, and look, I'm trying to go through to the conference board website. And it's frozen. Still being it updated. It's not working. So I could give you some commentary from them, but that's all we got for now. If you look at some of the components of consumer confidence, present situation index going to 137.4. That's a bit of a decline. And expectations are the real area of weakness here. 75.4 versus a revised 77.9 at the prior month. So, you know, not consumer confidence is meh. Well, that explains let's, let's all those it. strong sales of belt bags, Julie. Consumers feeling confident to spend near 100 bucks on a belt bag. It's not 100 bucks. You said Almost it's not after tax, 75. 78 after tax. But you can't get them bucks. anyway. You can't get them anyway. So. How much tax? How much? I don't know. 78 it's rounding up to 100? It's, 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 <laughs> it's quick math. I'm my spreadsheet in front of me. So, somebody's throwing their commission. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's go over, let, let's go over to Inez. She's at the uh, Wi-Fi Interactive with no belt bag. No belt bag, but they are handy, I will say. Good, Julie. <laughs> Let's take a look right now at what's happening with the markets because we are hugging the flat line really when it comes to the major averages, the S&P 500, the Nasdaq, and the Dow after yesterday's sell-off. Looking at where we're at with the 10-year Treasury, we are seeing the yield at 3.75%. Let's take a look right now at where we're at with these sectors because we are seeing energy that is leading right now after uh, also real estate and materials. You've got the defensive sectors, utilities, consumer staples, healthcare that are slightly in the red. Over on the NASDAQ 100, look at the mega caps. They're uh, slightly lower right now. Apple down about half of a percent. Amazon down eight tenths of a percent. Out of the big tech names, we're looking at Meta that's up seven tenths of a percent. But what you're really seeing are the uh, pockets of green here with the Chinese ADRs because these are really jumping. BABA up more than 5%, Pinduo Duo 7, JD.com up 8%. And finally, I just want to check out what's happening with the cryptocurrencies because Bitcoin is up uh, 1%, just above 16,300 per token. And then Ethereum seeing some gains right now up 3%, guys. Yahoo Finance's own Nes Foray. Nes, thanks so much for breaking this all down, tracking this with us as we're 33 minutes into today's trading activity here. Well, turning now for a closer look at the energy sector. We're taking a look at WTI and Brent on your screen there as investors eye potential for easing of China's COVID restrictions as it pushes elderly vaccinations following widespread protests against strict curbs. Joining us now for more on the energy space, we've got Ben Cook, Hennessy Midstream Fund and Hennessy Transition Fund Portfolio Manager. Great to have you here with us on set today. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right. So we've seen an outperformance in energy, of course, this year. Is that sustainable from your purview? Yeah, we think it is. You know, if you think back over the last 18 months, these companies have redirected a significant amount of cash flow uh, back to paying down debt, uh, returning cash to shareholders in the form of dividends and share repurchases. And that's improved the financial quality, the financial quality of these companies materially. So, you know, when we look at commodity fundamentals, what we expect for next year and the financial condition of the companies, we think that outperformance can be sustained. I mean, after a year of just strong runs, we mentioned uh, earlier in the show, Marathon, Occidental, what makes a good oil stock? What metrics are you looking at? Yeah, as, as part of our repeatable investment process in managing the Hennessy Energy Transition Fund, we look for a couple things. We look for a high quality asset base that has a low cost structure affording these companies with the ability to perform through the cycle. We're also looking for balance sheets that balance sheets that have a visible path towards improvement. And of course, we're looking for management teams that have been able to navigate through difficult times uh, as well as good times. So, you know, that's part of our, our process. Um, at this point in time, we're looking at, um, you know, both traditional hydrocarbon companies as well as renewable uh, technology or energy companies. And we see uh, more attractive investment merit in, across the traditional hydrocarbon uh, uh, value chain. I want to pick up on the balance sheet improvement question because, it, I mean, haven't they already done all the improving that there is to be done? Many of these companies, right, over the past couple of years and then going into now this um, stronger on a relative basis oil environment, like what more can they wring out? 
No, that's a great question. I think these companies, they have continued to lower debt and to, you know, to an extent, the additional cash flow is being returned in the form of share repurchases and dividends. And so, you know, we continue to see the free cash flow yield of these companies screening very attractively. You know, the large cap integrated group here in the U.S., free cash flow yields looking like 10 percent. The large cap U.S. E&P sector is looking like 15 percent. So, you know, we continue to see strong cash flows being redirected towards uh, the shareholder uh, in the form of repurchases and dividends. There's sort of a central puzzle um, when you're talking about these energy stocks, which is they've done enormous, very, very well. Yeah. And oil has now rolled over, right? Yes. And as of yesterday, one point touch negative for the year. Well, talk to us about that divergence, why it's been happening. And it sounds like you think it's going to continue to happen to some degree. Yeah, we do. I think, you know, historically, there's been a close correlation between the commodity, if you look at the 12 month uh, future strip, the average of the future 12 months, and the commodity and the equities, they've tracked fairly closely. And we, again, we've seen that divergence occur because I think the market is acknowledging that, the, again, the financial condition of these companies has improved dramatically. And, you know, over time, you know, as we see continued strength in commodity fundamentals, we expect that divergence to actually resolve to the upside with commodity prices moving higher. And we think the equities will continue to enjoy the benefit of that strong commodity environment. It's not just for oil, it's for natural gas as well. What volatility do you expect if we do see even more movements in OPEC policy as well and, and where the production moves forward from here? Yeah, OPEC's wrestling with a variety of issues right now. Obviously, weakness in China associated with zero COVID lockdown policy. Um, they're dealing with a global monetary uh, system that's tightening um, post-pandemic. Uh, um, you know, we continue to believe OPEC will be very supportive of, of crude prices. Um, they'd like to see oil prices higher uh, than where we are right now. Our base case is that we see a range of, of crude oil prices between $80 and $100 into 2023. And again, that should support very strong operational and financial results for the companies in our investable universe. This has really been the year, I would say, of the, the electric car, and it's going to be uh, decades of electric car, cars. Is that playing a role in your thinking of what stocks to pick and even to be exposed to the sector? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the trend towards electrification of the transportation sector is, is a mega trend theme. There will be a significant amount of capital that's focused on, you know, building out the infrastructure and, and, and inclu inclusive of the cars that will be, um, you know, purchased by the, uh, the, the base of the world consumer base. <clears throat> Ultimately, though, if you map the value chain uh, for many of the materials and metals that go into these, uh, these cars and the infrastructure, there are some gating issues. Uh, we think there's impediments to widespread adoption, and over time, that'll limit the pace of adoption. Ultimately, that'll prolong the use of hydrocarbons, the need for liquid transportation fuels, and, and again, ultimately, that'll be beneficial for the traditional hydrocarbon sector. Is there any either regulatory or um, investor sentiment risk? I mean, ExxonMobil is one of your top picks, right? And mm -hmm. that definitely um, has been one of, because it's one of the biggies, right? It's yeah. been one of those that's been vilified by either those who are navigating into more ESG portfolios sure. or those in Congress, yep. you know, for political reasons. How do you factor in that risk? Yeah, there, there's always a risk with policy. That's part of, you know, the calculus in, in determining the risk reward opportunity for the equities in the investable universe. And I think it's interesting what happened with the Inflation Reduction Act is we got a significant extension of production tax credits and investment tax credits for the renewable sector that relieved a lot of the policy risk. And, you know, you would automatically think that would be beneficial for the renewable companies. It's also beneficial for the traditional energy companies that are focused on carbon sequestration and capture. Um, companies like Oxy that are pursuing direct air capture, um, Exxon that's pursuing a, a, a carbon uh, capture hub along the Gulf of Mexico. These are, these are projects that, um, you know, prior to the Inflation Reduction Act had some merit, but that merit has only improved with the Inflation Reduction Act. So policy has actually been favorable for those projects. Ben Cook, Portfolio Manager of the Hennessy Midstream Fund and Hennessy Transition Fund. Good to see you. Thanks for coming to the studio. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right, before we head to break, let's highlight some winners and losers in retail to kick off the holiday shopping season. Morgan Stanley is calling out Lululemon, American Eagle Outfitters, and Victoria's Secret as early winners due to lower discounting versus last year and strong store traffic. On the other hand, retail losers include the Gap Division and Banana Republic, which is also owned by Gap. Coming up, more legal trouble for Sam Banking Free. Julie's back with that, plus we look at more of today's top headlines next.
Let's get a check on some other headlines that we are watching now. The billionaire co-founder of private equity firm Apollo Global Management, Leon Black, is being accused of rape. That's in a lawsuit filed by Cherry Pearson. It says that Black raped her at the mansion of disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein two decades ago. Pearson says she has rendered had rendered massages to Epstein and Black in 2002, but Black then had physically overpowered her. Lawyers for Black say Pearson's lawsuit is, quote, categorically false and, quote, a scheme. A disclosure, Apollo Global Management is the parent company of Yahoo Finance. The Royal Bank of Canada is buying HSBC's Canadian banking business for $13.5 billion in cash, marking the largest deal ever reached between two domestic banks in that country. If approved, the purchase would see RBC consolidate its position as Canada's largest bank and boost its business among wealthier Canadians. The move comes as HSBC is pushed by shareholders to split its Asian and Western-focused operations. This, according to the FT, RBC says it expects, expects to save $740 million in pre-tax costs annually and incur acquisition and integration costs of a billion dollars. That deal expected to close late next year. And crypto lender BlockFi is suing Sam Bankman-Fried in an attempt to gain shares of Robinhood that Bankman-Fried had pledged as collateral before the collapse of FTX. BlockFi itself filed for bankruptcy protection yesterday and filed this suit hours later. BlockFi alleged a severe liquidity crunch triggered by the breakdown of FTX in its filing and says SBF attempted to raise funds by selling its Robinhood shares using the secure messaging app Signal. Sam Bankman-Fried purchased roughly 7.5% of Robinhood shares earlier this year. Klaus? Big banks are weighing in on the state of the economy. Bank of America and Goldman Sachs are both out with their equity outlooks and S&P 500 price targets. For the latest, latest on those, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Semenova. Alexandra. Well, guys, it's that time of year again when Wall Street's big banks are looking at their magic eight balls to tell investors what they expect for the year ahead. And if you're an equity investor, there is not much to look forward to. The S&P 500 will trade just 1% higher than yesterday's close. That's according to the price target of strategists at both Bank of America and Goldman Sachs. And the culprit for that is weak corporate earnings growth. That has been a theme for the new year on Wall Street. On Goldman's side, strategists led by David Costin said that there will be less pain but no gain for U.S. stocks. They estimate earnings per share on S&P 500 companies to be unchanged at roughly $224, attributing this lack of growth to sustained higher rates. Uh, and this is, of course, based on their base case scenario that the economy will not enter recession. Uh, if it does, that, that, of course, could be much worse. And then on Bank of America's side, they see earnings per share falling 9% to $200. They attributed this to two things. The first is the erosion of margins across companies. Uh, their near-term bearishness is based on uh, wage growth outpacing the ability of companies to raise prices, which will really weigh on their earnings. According to their research, only half of, uh, half of the S&P 500 companies are posting real sales growth. Uh, and the second is really quite interested, interesting. They call this the wealth effect on steroids. So basically, the wealth effect is a be behavioral economic phenomenon uh, that suggests that consumers spend more as they see the value of their assets rise. And in this case, they think because of the democratized of finance that we saw because so many more people were making Robin Hood accounts, participating in SPAC deals and other areas of the market. Uh, more people will be participating in the erosion of $22 trillion in wealth that we have seen last year that is going to weigh on consumer spending power. In the new year, they are still bullish in the long term. They see the S&P 500 returning 8% annually over the next 10 years. Uh, they put out a really interesting stat. They said, if you own the S&P 500 index for a day, the chances of making money are are just more than a coin flip, about 54%. But if you own it for 10 years, there's a 94% chance of making money. So it pays off to be a long-term investor. Wow, all right, two-sided coin there. Um, well, at least in the near term. We'll see uh, what the perspective is for the long term. That's their outlook, actually, for stocks. So what about for the economic picture as well? Yeah, so they see the economy, uh, two, two very different pictures there. Bank of America sees the U.S. heading into a mild recession in the first half of the year. They see unemployment rising to 5.5 percent. Uh, their target for the federal funds rate is 5 to 5.25 percent. But they did say that it could reach six, as high as 6 percent because of the continued momentum that we have seen in the economy and in the labor market. Uh, they don't see the Fed cutting rates until December. And then Goldman Sachs uh, sees the unemployment rate at 4.2%, just half a percentage point higher than it is right now. The federal fund 
funds rate also at 5% to 5.25%. Uh, and they don't expect a rate cut next year because they don't think that the U.S. economy will head into recession. They don't think that a slowdown in inflation will be enough for the Fed to cut rates. Thanks for tracking this all. Alexander Seminova, Yahoo Finance Zone, breaking this down for us. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Coming up, everyone, the possible production hit Apple could face from disruption in China. We're going to speak with an analyst from Oppenheimer. What's coming up next? Welcome back. Apple's iPhone Pro production is set to take a hit due to ongoing disturbances at a key manufacturing plant in China that's according to Bloomberg and could impact as many as 6 million units of the device. Joining us now to discuss the financial future implications for Apple is Oppenheimer analyst Martin Yang. Martin, great to have you here with us today and thanks for taking the time. First, when you think about what this near-term impact could look like for Apple given the disruptions in production, you know, what do you kind of ballpark that figure to be right now? Sure. Yeah. Some of the uh, back of the envelope math suggests that um, when we consider loss of capacity in November um, and December, if we factor in a 30% loss in a single month, that would translate to three and a half to four million units of shortfall in the production of iPhone Pro, 14 Pro, and Pro Max. If that uh, loss of capacity expands to 50% for a single month that translate to over 6 million units. And uh, so far, our base case is a 30% loss of capacity. But based on the recent development, it seems that that loss of capacity may sustain um, throughout November and uh, may be extending into December. Uh, Martin, you, like many analysts, though, are also saying that they'll then make up that capacity, right, early next year. Mm -hmm. But if they don't make it up to early next year, what are the implications for the holiday season? Is Apple going to take a hit to sales because people are going to want to buy the phones and won't be able to get them? Um, so the loss of holiday sales is already happening. Um, and uh, as 
uh, when, when I checked last week, and the earliest date you could get your hands on iPhone Pro and Pro Max in the U.S. as well as in China is well after Christmas. Uh, I think uh, the earliest day was uh, end of December. And uh, so um, now you're out of luck if you try to get an iPhone um, by Christmas. Um, so the uh, earliest you can get, it will be sometime in January. The holiday sales is already, um, some portion of holiday sales is already lost. Martin, is Apple at this point just a, a Teflon stock? If concerns about iPhone shortages this holiday season are, isn't going to take the stock down, if recession fears aren't going to take the stock down, what could take the stock down? Uh, I think uh, there are two main issues um, lying ahead of Apple for 2023. Uh, number one is we've seen two years of very strong upgrade and replacement cycle for iPhone, starting from iPhone 12, iPhone 13, iPhone 14 this year. And that replacement cycle strength may uh, weaken into 23 um, by two factors. One is the majority of the install base who is most likely to upgrade um, has already a new iPhone. And then uh, continued macro pressure will cause certain uh, group of consumers to delay their upgrade. And then secondly, um, there are ongoing pressure regarding Apple's services and software revenues. Uh, for example, if Apple is forced to reduce its App Store take rate down from 30% to 15%, that could have some temporary uh, downward pressure on Apple's margin as well as revenue. Do you see any consumers looking across the rest of the Apple ecosystem and saying, you know what, I, I, I don't need another watch or I don't need an iPad or the wearables. How might this also impact other elements of that broader just hardware ecosystem that they have, but also the services that are reliant on that install base continuing to increase? I think uh, those individual pockets of consumer sentiment uh, have a rather insignificant impact on overall Apple's results uh, because um, Apple is still seeing very robust number or percentage of new consumers coming into the ecosystem through Apple Watch, iPad, and MacBook. And those are very good leading indicator of future growth of the software and service revenues. Um, so as long as we are still seeing those healthy, fresh users come into the system, I'm not that worried. Martin, I want to switch gears and uh, turn the topic to Twitter for a moment and Elon Musk's seemingly new war um, with Apple and with Tim Cook over the App Store, over what he says is, um, you know, Apple not being on the side of free speech. You know, Apple, I think it's pretty well known what Apple requires for app developers to be on the App Store. What do you mean? And also, I think it's fair to say, safe to say, Twitter needs Apple a lot more than Apple needs Twitter. But what do you make of this? Is, that, is this just a blip? Is this something that investors don't need to pay attention to? Uh, I think investors does need to pay attention to this um, spat between Elon Musk and Apple. Uh, it points to two major issues. Number one is Apple's standards of um, content moderation for apps going through its app store. Uh, number two is, uh, is Apple um, um, entitled to the 30% app store fees. The first issue is much more complicated uh, because if you look across Twitter, uh, in this, um, I would say, power struggle between Twitter, the app, and Apple as a platform, Apple does have a lot more um, power over Twitter because um, you know the, the content available on Twitter is not up for scrutiny and some of the content is um, I, th I think Apple will be able to make the case that some of the content is distasteful and um, you know anywhere from the structure uh, the, the spectrum of distasteful and dangerous. Um, so if Apple wants, I think Apple could make the case to remove Twitter off its platform and also considering Twitter has uh, a reduced staff over content moderation and uh, that is putting Twitter the app um, 
up for more risk going forward. And then in the topic of the 30% App Store fees, I think that is endangering Twitter's move over the subscription plan uh, as it wants to have the blue check mark at $8 per month. And Apple is eligible to charge anywhere between 15 to 30% fees from that subscription if done over uh, the in-app purchase. And I think Twitter is less um, at risk uh, because a lot of the users are using Twitter through uh, PC and other um, non-mobile platform or non-mobile um, uh, channels. How much of this is also Apple posturing itself given that they've got a digital advertising business that they're trying to ramp up and continue to allow to compete <laughs> given the install base that they have, but as well the number of advertisers and marketers that, that realize where in the funnel Apple's users sit within that kind of broader marketing ecosystem too and the purchase decisions that they can make more readily. Now, in terms of direct competition in digital advertising, I think there's uh, maybe less overlap between Twitter and Apple. Apple is going after a lot of the app in stores um, and a lot of programmatic advertising uh, and also search ads on uh, App Store, whereas Twitter has a much bigger exposure to brand advertising. So that's a market Apple currently doesn't really play a big role in. Martin, thank you so much. Really great to get your perspective on this. Oppenheimer Senior Analyst, Martin Yang. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Turning to another stock that we are watching closely, Roku battling yet another downgrade on Wall Street, although the stock is bouncing 1.5%. KeyBank, though, is lowering the company to sector weight, citing its lack of profitability in the connected TV streaming market. Yahoo Finance's Alexander Canal joins us now to share the details. I mean, the stock has gone down a lot already, yes. even though it's seen that little pop today. Gone down a lot already. And on the in the pre-market trading, on the heels of that downgrade, it was down as much as 4%. Interesting to see somewhat of a recovery today. But that key bank analyst, Justin Patterson, he had been a longtime bull on this company, but he downgraded shares, citing that consensus estimates for 2023 and 2024 appear too optimistic. He noted that his previous bullish uh, expectations for the company, like outsides growth and connected TV advertising, as well as Roku becoming a critical partner for a lot of those media giants that ultimately that didn't materialize. In fact, he said that Roku seems to have lost market share in addition to increasing its debt in ad tech. And if you want to solve all these problems, you need to heavily invest. And that's going to pressure those growth targets that have been set for gross margins, revenue and profitability. And he really isn't alone in this thinking. A lot of other analysts on the street downgrading the stock over the past month, five firms in total, including KeyBank, 12-month uh, consensus price targets average roughly $59 a share. And you were just seeing on your screen, according to data from Bloomberg, analyst recommendations, 13 buys, 12 uh, holds, and six sells. So a lot of uncertainty that Roku has warned about, but investors still don't want to hear it. And it sounds like a lot of uncertainty within the ranks at Roku. They're now laying people off. Yep, 200 uh, employees have been laid off, according to the company. And this is something that Patterson did address in his note. Will this stop the bleeding? The short answer is, is no. He argued that despite that headcount reduction, Roku will not be able to meaningfully pull back investments in other areas like North America, international TVs, content, and ad tech, because that will ultimately slow the revenue recovery story. So layoffs still not enough to achieve that 2024 EBITDA profitability target. And that's sort of been the name of the game this year on Wall Street. If you're not maintaining those profits, you're going to get punished. Can we talk some originals as well here, yes. Ali? I mean, Roku is also entering the streaming originals game with Weird, the Al Yankovic story. Uh, what are the pros and the cons for them there? And P.S., I thought Hulu did that. I didn't really? realize it was a Roku movie. Yes, it was a Roku original. This movie came out November 4th. Roku didn't release the exact figures, but did say that millions of users tuned in to watch the film during its first weekend. It went on to secure the largest opening weekend audience, propelled a ton of engagement on the site. And that's what you're seeing tech companies like Amazon. They really want to create a very sticky platform. And this is one strategy that Roku could have. Although I must say that Content production, original programming, it's a loser's game. We have seen that with Netflix, Disney really struggling with streaming profitability. And I think that Roku has a lot of other issues going on right now in addition to this shaky macro environment that perhaps 
this might not be the right timing for them to invest in originals, but again, there are the positives that it does create buzz, it does drive new users, and it creates that stickiness that a lot of these companies want. I, I really want to see that movie. Yeah, another one from my Hollywood. Great list. reviews, great it's reviews. It's supposed to be really good, yes. It's yeah. like a biopic while also spoofing biopics. And Daniel Radcliffe as an yes. A-list cast. I mean, the expectations were already high, and it seems to have delivered. Win, yeah. win, win. Ali Canal, thanks so much, appreciate it. Coming up, we chat with the CEO of Volvo US as recession fears begin to weigh on auto sales. We'll be right back. Volvo is speeding toward an EV future and the build out of key infrastructure in the U.S. Yahoo yeah, Finance senior auto correspondent Praz Subramanian has more on this. Praz. Right, Saz. Volvo's first dedicated EV is here, the EX90 SUV. Very popular model for them was the predecessor, XC90. So Volvo wanted to get this thing right here, the seven seat SUV. Uh, I have around 300 miles of EV range and features like bi directional charging. Uh, and we built it in the U.S. as well, like you mentioned. So earlier I spoke to Andres Gustafsson, the SVP of Volvo Cars Americas and president and CEO of Volvo Cars USA about the new EX90, but also the lingering supply chain crisis, which is still a problem today. Here's what he had to say. Absolutely. We are, we are kind of a, living that kind of a world too. Uh, so what I'm kind of a replying on, I know what I know today, but I don't know if it's going to be uh, additional COVID issues uh, on our supplier side. And that's the kind of a, it's troublesome, but also we have learned to live with it and we, we, we plan and, and take decisions based on week per week. We have a quite good control over the, the last weeks of 2022. So, uh, and as you know, we can never control weather uh, and, and of course it's always logistic issues, but, but overall uh, what we see today looks, looks strong. The demands on the US market is very, very, very strong. And that's the same in the other countries in America. Canada is also doing well. And our um, office in Brazil is also uh, waiting for more cars. So things are improving a bit and Anders did tell me, though he couldn't divulge numbers yet, that he's quote, very happy with sales in November. So we're seeing an increase in, in focus towards software and digitalization in the auto sector as well, Pros. 
Is that something that we can accept or expect to see more of from Volvo here too? Yeah, Tesla really took the charge here with software and services like OTA updates and buying cars online. Volvo sees this as the future too, one where the automakers are super focused on tech and software offerings. Here's what Anders had to say about, or that the automakers are now engaged in a tech arms race. Absolutely. That's, uh, I can kind of, um, it's a very good question. And that's really what we're working with right now. It goes fast and we would like to kind of, it's, it's always better. I didn't say cheaper, I said better to have that kind of a core competence inside the company because then we can be faster. And uh, to run a car manufacturer, it's a lot of things is about, you know, speed. Speed cannot compensate the wrong direction, but uh, it's if we are in the right direction, and I think we are, uh, then this is going to be a successful tool to achieve that. So they're leaning in here on it from in-car software to service offerings. It's something uh, Saz Ford CEO Jim Farley told me once that they're actually hiring dozens and dozens and dozens of engineers from uh, Silicon Valley. Jim Farley knows. <laughs> and, and also on a separate note, we are watching just Wardstown today, which is not a stock that we often watch. We have and to. The stock is actually going up. Um, what? It's received final approval to actually ship the things. But when are they actually going to people? When are people actually going to be driving? So they said they, they got the full homologation, which means they got the U.S. approval to sell in the United States. They were able to meet all their requirements. They're uh, past the EPA uh, kind of guidelines as well. Uh, they said the first batch of 500 endurance EV pickups are leaving the Foxconn plant in Ohio for customers now. So we'll see how they ramp up, but they're actually starting to deliver right now. Well, my, my promise still holds true. I don't know if you remember from about a month and a half ago. I, if this company ever reaches scale, Lordstown, I will lick the bottom of my shoe on this set. I mean, I, so I'm, reiter I'm reiterating that. my call on that. Nobody wants I, I, I come, I, I'm sorry, I really agree with that in terms of like, this company's had so many issues ramping up and I've heard some quality concerns about their trucks, so we'll see where they mm. go. Have you ever driven one? I have not, I have not. Yeah, I guess not if they haven't gotten the approval to <laughs> there you put go. them out there. Thanks yeah. so much, Pros, yeah. appreciate it. Coming up, the state of the shipping industry. We'll speak with the president of Convoy on how the company is combating the inventory setbacks that we have seen characterized the past couple of years and now flaring up in a different way.
beginning, the president has been very clear. Shutdown uh, is unacceptable uh, because of the impact that it would have on jobs and families uh, and farms and businesses and communities just across the country. The president is directly involved in the process and has been engaged. That was what the White House press secretary on President Biden's efforts to avert a potential December 5th rail strike, which could freeze U.S. cargo shipments, exacerbate inflation, cost the U.S. as much as $2 billion a day. That's according to the Association of American Railroads. Joining out to weigh in on the state of freight as retailers look to clear their inventory glut amid these critical labor negotiations is the president of Convey, Convoy, it's president and chief operating officer Mark Okerstrom. Thank you so much for being here, Mark. Obviously, it's a busy time of year right already, right, in the freight business, and then you layer on these negotiations on top of it. So I want to start there. What effect would this have on um, the, now you sit on the trucking side of things. What effect yeah. would it have on your industry if this rail strike were to happen? Yeah, well, it would be really significant, particularly this time of year. Uh, about 7,000 of these rail cars are moving every day long haul. It's about 40% of the long haul freight in the U.S. is moved on rail cars. It would take about 470,000 new long haul trucks to essentially come into the market and replace this. So it'd be very, very significant. Uh, we don't have the capacity to do it. It would push up diesel prices uh, and really cause a very significant disruption. This is a disruption on the inventory front as well for some of the retailers that are looking to get through the, the necessary items, apparel, the, the SKUs and, and get them to the right locations as well. And so if we see that pushed out even further into 2023, after a holiday season where we're already seeing some signs that consumers are, are being just a little bit more hesitant about how much they're spending. What type of kind of impact does that have to some of the companies and their inventory levels as well that we've been tracking? Well, I mean, these are companies that have already had inventory challenges, you know, going all the way back from 2020, COVID disruption in 2021 continued uh, this year. So I think it would just be adding disruption upon disruption. Now, we're certainly hopeful, uh, given what we saw on Black Friday, what we saw on Thanksgiving, Cyber Monday. I mean, the consumer has got their wallet out for the right uh, opportunity that maybe we can clear out some of this inventory avert this rail strike and things will be back on track. But if we're not able to do that, I think we'll continue to see more disruption through the first half of 2023. Mark, how is the pricing environment for logistics services today compared to six months ago? Well, it's down pretty significantly. I mean, you saw in 2021 through the first quarter of this year, uh, full truckload, which is our focus area, truck prices uh, or freight prices really near record peaks. And then starting in Q2, things started to really slow down. You're seeing spot prices in freight down 30, 35 percent uh, year over year. Again, this is spot sort of last minute uh, truckload capacity that's being sold in the open market. Uh, so it's pretty significant. And that's putting pressure on the owner operator truck drivers. Prices are coming down at the same time as fuel prices are going up. And that's putting the squeeze on the owner operators, which is a big focus for uh, for convoy. And so what do you do about that, I guess? I mean, are there ways of taking capacity out right in terms of the number of trucks on the road? Although obviously that doesn't help the owner operators either. Is there a way of, uh, yeah. of ma maximizing and putting together loads in trucks? You know, how do you address it? Yeah. Well, I think Convoy is really addressing the core of this. One of the core problems for owner operators is really utilization. Uh, about 35% of the miles that are driven by trucks in the U.S. every single day are driven empty. They're driven empty, but they're still burning fuel. Uh, and what Convoy has done is digitally connected owner operators uh, onto our platform. And we provide freight services to largely Fortune 500 shippers. And by taking you know, this large, consistent volume of freight, uh, we're enabling owner operators to bundle it together and essentially be more efficient, allowing them to earn more money, even amidst uh, some of these challenges we're seeing with rising fuel prices. When do you see a changeover coming in terms of the types of trucks that are being used? I mean, we, we've heard increasingly from companies like Tesla and a more sustainable uh, long haul truck that could be leveraged for the industry. You know, do you think that's something that's a near term reality or are we talking, you know, five, 10 years out uh, for even some of the most environmentally sustainable, but also even in some cases, maybe autonomous trucking to be coming forward? 
Yeah. You know, I think it's a medium term type thing. I mean, certainly there's been forward thinking automators, automakers uh, like Volvo. I think that you mentioned previously uh, that's also big in the trucking industry, um, you know, right here uh, in Seattle. You know, of course, we've got uh, the makers of Peterbilt and, and et cetera that are, uh, you know, building EV trucks. So it's coming, but it's going to take a while. Uh, infrastructure has got to be built. Uh, the battery capacity is essentially got to be there to haul these big, heavy loads. Uh, but I think it'll get there. And, you know, they say change happens slowly and then it happens quickly. So uh, we'll see. But it's probably a five five year horizon, certainly not next year that we'll see mass adoption. And Mark, there's been a shift really over the past two quarters and, and people uh, are spending more on experiences like travel. How is that impacting the outlook for logistics services next year? Well, this has been one of the things that has really led to some of the tapering off of freight uh, movements in the U.S., in addition to the inventory uh, excess and, and supply chain issues that we talked about earlier. Consumers are still spending, but they have shifted more of that spend to travel. Uh, we've been hearing words like revenge travel, people saying, I've been cooped up forever. I got to get out there and see the world. I'm going further. I'm going longer. I don't have to come into the office anymore. And that is impacting the amount of money that consumers are, are taking out of their wallet and spending on goods. But the spend is still at, at pretty strong levels. You are the former CEO of Expedia. So you, you have a host of knowledge and a wealth of experience within that travel industry too. And you know, Sazi kind of teed it up there a moment ago, but when you think about kind of the broader travel industry, if I may kind of go into your historical wheelhouse there, we've heard of a, a golden yeah. age of travel. Do you believe that you know, even from what you're hearing from some of your own peers in the industry or in the historical travel industry, what are they saying to you about when corporate travel might even come back as well right now, or if it will even yeah. get back to pre-pandemic levels? Yeah, well, that's the big question. I mean, leisure travel was the first to come back and it has come back with a vengeance. I mean, supply cannot keep up with demand. You're seeing, you know, the issues with the airlines just not being able to keep pilots and staff, uh, you know, TSA not being able to deal with the volume. So the, the consumer is back. But the real question is what happens with the business traveler? People are not yet back to the office all over the country, let alone all over the world. Uh, people have developed new habits. Uh, I think it will come back, but I think it is going to take some time for business travel as we know it, to come back to the levels it was pre-pandemic. All right, extremely generous to uh, take us into your historical experience as well as your current experience <laughs> as well at uh, Convoy. Thank you so much, Mark Okerstrom, President and COO over at Convoy. We appreciate the time. Great, thanks for having me on. Definitely. Guys, coming up, it's back to the office for Snap employees. The brand of Ghostface Chilla gonna have some people <laughs> back in its offices. We're gonna share the details next.
Play the music. Time for Cut for Time. Three stories, one minute each. We start with this. Snap CEO Evan Spiegel announced his expectation for workers to get back to the office, return to the office 80% of the time beginning in February as the social media company looks to bounce back from its 20% staff reduction back in August. Quite a way to look to bounce back. Tell everybody to come back to the office. Here. Yeah, for those who said the office was dead permanently, well, this is one of the many signs is proving them wrong, I think, and also showing the pendulum is swinging back, one of the many signs, right, mm. to show that the pendulum is swinging back towards employers in terms of holding the reins of, of power here in the marketplace. Snap's not alone. Yesterday it was uh, Bob Iger in his presentation uh, in front of employees saying he believes in the power of the office, thinks employees should be back there. The power of the office. The, the office. magic of the office. Oh, oh yeah, man. that would be much more Disney for yes. him to say the magic of the office. Listen, we're here every day. I can say a word in praise of the magic of the office yep. and in being in person with other people. You know, I've been very consistent on this. I like being around other people in person. The printer runs way warmer here at the office than at Brad HQ. <laughs> so. My printer doesn't even work at home. There's also so. paper here, so that's good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right, Merriam-Webster is announcing its top word of 2022, gaslighting. The word, which is defined as the act or practice of grossly misleading someone, saw a 1,740% increase in lookups in 2022. And I was thinking back, I don't know if I've really used this word a lot. I, I definitely haven't written it in any story at all. I, I think probably it has been misused just misused. as much as many multiples of times since it's been looked up this year. Yeah, I think it rose in the ranks of popularity, especially over the course of the previous administration, for sure, uh, given the amount of times that I woke up in night sweats sometimes because of just what the president would say over Twitter back then. Um, and that's when we heard more of this word being used. So the rise in the ranks and popularity in searches, um, but the misuse of it uh, potentially is something to course correct here. For. Yeah, and the origin of gaslighting is actually from a movie from the 40s, I oh. believe. That's where the movie, that's where it came from. I think the movie Fun was fact, called right? Gaslight. Huh. So that, another one to add to your list, uh, to your viewing list, guys. <laughs> that is yes. news you can use. You I dig it. Sure. All right. Uh, and the, finally, the FIFA World Cup. Ooh, a little early there. The FIFA World <laughs> Cup has shined a spotlight on another competition between fan tokens. Ooh. We are talking crypto, people. The trading volume for these cryptocurrencies linked to sports teams has risen to $300 million in November, according to a Paris-based crypto data firm. You wonder if though they're going to go the way of what were the what were the cards? Uh, I don't the, even remember what they were the, called now. The Pokemon trading cards? cards? They were crypto cards. Crypto cards. Or crypto oh, the, not the NFTs. They, they were linked to the NBA Top Shots. Oh, Top Shots. Okay. Top Shots. All right. Where do I buy them? I can't even You don't. You don't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't the know FIFA thing, the FIFA things? Yeah. Oh, I don't know where yeah, you buy those. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure honestly. Um, but it's been an interesting World Cup so far and of course this is the time when many of them even months ago would probably have planned out what their crypto strategy would be. And yeah, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo got into that just a little bit late on the NFT front as we've seen that market really collapse and, and falter here. So now it's a question of where some of these crypto plays will actually hold some weight. Well, these people are still buying them apparently. Yeah, People who are fans of uh, football. They'll have it. Sure. Yeah, why not? All right, <laughs> let's get a final check on the markets here before we leave you. We've got all three major averages. Well, I was gonna say in the green, but then the Dow ticked into the red. So uh -huh. not much change here on the day. Not a lot of driving factors for trading today. We do have Jay Powell speaking tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So that will be something certainly the market will be paying attention to. Maybe we'll get a little more direction there. I wish I had a fan token of Jay Powell. I'm, I'm a fan. Palcoin? Palcoin. There you would buy. Palcoin. There I would, you would buy, buy a Palcoin. Invest yeah. in, with the Palcoin. in the NFT of Powell. I can understand that at least. All right. Are you listening, Jay? All right. <laughs> coming up next, Akiko Fujita and Rochelle Akufo are going to speak with the CEO of Tools Group on the back of those record Cyber Monday sales and what they tell us about what's going on in retail. You don't want to miss that.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa with Akiko Fujita. Here's what we're watching for you this hour. China front and center. Bets on a faster exit from zero COVID lift Asia stocks and crude. But U.S. equities still looking to gain momentum in early trade. Is hawkish Fed speak keeping a lid on the optimism? And data shows consumers spent over $11.3 billion on Cyber Monday. That's almost 6% higher than last year. We asked the CEO of Tools Group how big the inventory problem still is. And crypto assets catching a bid this morning despite angst building over the FTX fallout. We'll speak with a member of the House Financial Services Committee ahead of some key hearings in the Capitol. First, let's take a look at how the major indices are performing today. As we can see, it was a bit of a mixed picture, but we see the Dow there still just edging into positive territory. The S&P there up about, it's relatively flat as well, up about a tenth of a percent. And the tech heavy Nasdaq also relatively flat, just about, about seven points there in positive territory. Also keeping an eye on what we're seeing with the Treasury market. We did see that they've been off to the races today. And also keeping an eye on the difference between the three-month Treasury bill yield inversion to the 10-year Treasury bond. In the last 60 years, the yield curve was inverted in 2000 and a recession followed. Similar inversions in 1979 and 1973 were also followed by a recession. So keeping an eye on there, you see the 10-year there still relatively flat, but up about 0.8% on the day. Well, to start the hour, we're taking a look at China as reopening pressures grow amid protests over strict COVID zero curbs. The country will bolster vaccination amongst its senior citizens as China seeks a path to reopening. And Akiko, as this has been building momentum, we saw that it did pair back a little bit as China had university students go home, probably to stop a lot of these gatherings and these rallies continuing. Yeah, no question about that. When you look at the protests and you look at the uptick we have seen in cases, this has really put Chinese President Xi Jinping in a quarter, uh, corner at a time when there are serious questions about the company, uh, country's economic growth prospects. You know, we started the year with a target of 5.5%. Clearly, they're not going to reach that. You had Nomura, which has been very bearish on China, coming out and saying they expect growth to be around 2.4% in Q4. You've got 20 percent unemployment among the youngest employees. And these are the ones that are going out and showing their discontent. Now, uh, Rochelle, I, I think it's important to sort of take a step back to, to put this in context. Why we're seeing the protests play out at a time where we're seeing an uptick in these cases. 80 cities currently fighting a surge in COVID cases right now. You compare that to where it was in the spring, just 50 cities. Yes, Shanghai was a big deal and that was a huge lockdown. But this is significantly more than what we saw back in the spring. And all of this, of course, elevating, as you mentioned, these social tensions that we have seen play out across the country. Uh, really hard to overstate how significant it is to, to see these kind of protests, the most widespread protests we've seen since the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. And then, of course, on Tuesday over in China, as expected, we have seen that crackdown coming with students being asked to go home, uh, also crack down on social media. We've gotten reports over uh, in some major cities of police stopping pedestrians to check their apps, check their phones to see who's actually organizing all of this. So, you know, it, it's certainly interesting to see how all of this has kind of come to a head at a time when some would argue that the Chinese government potentially could have been thinking about easing on those COVID restrictions. I mean, it does seem to be a failure to adapt. We're seeing that some footage that's being broadcast on Chinese state broadcasters, perhaps blurring out some of these images of supporters at the World Cup who don't have masks on, because it is that stark reminder that the rest of the world is opening up and managing COVID without having a zero COVID policy and getting back to normal. So I understand the frustration. People getting, obviously staying locked down in China when they have health emergencies. That's another thing that's also fueling the protest. People want to be people want to be let out. They want to, they want more freedom. And it's interesting though because when you look at how some of these Chinese stocks and ADRs are reacting, some of these are, are a longer play, waiting for China to turn around at some point. But others are looking at this longer view that look, the lockdowns aren't going anywhere anytime soon. So you have companies like Alibaba, Baidu, Pinduoduo, JD.com, e-commerce. They're relying on people staying home and continuing continuing to stay home and perhaps purchase online, whether it's food or technology, and they're having to work from home because perhaps there isn't a silver lining anytime soon, Akiko. Yeah, and of course, we're watching those Chinese companies, but the impact to a company's international exposure is certainly significant. We've been talking about Apple a lot because of the hit they're likely to take. 
when you think about these cities that have been hit the hardest, we're talking about 90% of exports coming from there. So no question a trickle effect to come here. Supply chain disruptions, we have seen this story before, but something that we're gonna continue to follow as we see this uptick in cases over in China. Well, turning now to the broader markets as investors have a lot to digest this week on both the economic front and of course, what we've been talking about, China. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Inez Foray, who's tracking all of the headlines for us this morning. Inez. Akiko and investors this week will be paying attention to a slew of economic data, but two important ones being the jobs report on Friday with economists expecting some 200,000 jobs to have been added in the month of November. That's a slowdown from the previous month, but still historically high when you consider the average of 150 to 200,000 jobs that were added in, in 2019. Uh, so you could see uh, uh, hotter than expected. We'll, we'll see what happens with that. But this is important because the Fed would uh, be taking cues from things like the jobs report. Also, another point is the PCE, personal consumption expenditure price index. That's expected to come in at a rate of 6%. Fund managers are saying until you get to 4% for that rate, don't expect the Fed pivot anytime soon. And, and as, as, uh, as Kiko was mentioning, the domino effect of China also weighing on investors' minds. Yeah, that's right. Uh, because of supply chain issues that Akiko was mentioning and uh, what multinationals are facing when it comes to those supply chain issues, not just because of the uh, uh, COVID lockdowns there and the protests, but also because of geopolitical issues. And we've heard more and more analysts talking about the geopolitics between China and the U.S., China cozying up with Russia. In fact, earlier this morning, we had Stephen Roach uh, from Yale University talking about multinationals and how they had made a bet on China to produce all their goods, uh, mainly in China, and now they are reconsidering those bets. So we have seen analysts talking about a period of deglobalization that we're going to start seeing, not depending so much on China, perhaps, so that will continue to have an impact on supply chain issues and also on inflation because of that. So they all tie together. Ines Ferre, thank you so much. All right, well, now let's take a look at China's COVID policy concerns and, of course, that hawkish U.S. Fed speak through an economic lens with Sarahan Hatopolu, Business Environment Risk Intelligence CEO. Sarahan, good to see you. So I first want to, to pick up uh, what Inez was saying about what's coming out of China and some of the decisions some of these multinational companies are having to make. How would you characterize the situation right now? Well, it is a, it's a big chaotic environment right now, unfortunately, uh, but it is one that um, a lot of the corporations have been expecting, Rochelle, because things have not really improved between the two countries, um, uh, even after former President uh, Donald Trump has left the office. So there was this um, steady movement towards uh, a crisis, and uh, that is going to be felt more often and more frequently, actually, in the next uh, three to six months. And I believe that uh, some multinational corporations have started to make alternative plans, as you mentioned earlier in the report. Um, for example, India is becoming an interesting emerging market uh, to, to host uh, a lot of the multinational corporations that have a uh, stake uh, in, in China. Yeah, no question these companies have been thinking about it, but they haven't necessarily moved on it just yet. Those plans are in place but there's still significant exposure to China. So when you think about the economic hit that China is likely to take from this latest uptick, how does that trickle over into the broader global economy at a time where we are seeing a slowdown already? Oh, it's going to make it worse, Akiko. That's that's for sure. Uh, look, we're not only this is not only in China, right? You mentioned that there's a global economic slowdown taking place. Look at the numbers uh, that came in the U.S. recently, the Consumer Confidence Index, and all that. So uh, there's going to be short-term pain. But uh, the uh, client uh, engagements that I've been involved with uh, clearly tell me every time that I talk to, to clients that their alternative plans are being made, but there's going to be short-term pain. So the, the plans are in progress, um, but the supply chain issues that a lot of these corporations are experiencing is going to hit their bottom uh, bottom and top uh, top lines, uh, in the again, in the short-term period. And Sarahan, when you think about things like delays throughout the supply chain, especially for a lot of these products that are, that are made in China, in terms of how that trickles down to then inflation and then what we saw with the latest consumer, consumer sentiment numbers ticking just slightly lower, but still better than expected, the consumer is still resilient. But how long can they hang on if some of these inflation um, headwinds that we're seeing from other countries continue to trickle in? Well, I don't know, Rochelle, if I would say that 
that they're resilient at this point. Uh, the numbers were a little better in the Consumer Confidence Index, but look, we're looking at uh, three things that are happening in the country. One is the wealth effect. We're seeing it in the stock market, we're seeing it in the bond market, and the property market where the house prices uh, fell for the third straight month, uh, according to today's data. So that is going to have an impact on the, uh, on the consumers. It already is actually, but it's gonna get worse in the next six months or so. And the top 20 um, in terms of income in this country account for 40% of retail sales. If we take that into consideration, then that wealth effect is going to be uh, a drag on, on consumer spending. Uh, likewise, interest rates, they're not going anywhere. They're not going, they're not going uh, further down or anything. It's actually going to go up. If you listen to New York Fed president yesterday, uh, they are going to increase rates more. And then the energy costs, you know, everybody's talking about how inflation has peaked and it may have, and the energy costs are coming down, but winter is coming and we're gonna have that impact as well on the consumer spending. So overall, um, uh, my expectations from consumer confidence as well as retail sales and consumption is not very positive. Really quickly, Sarhan, where does this put um, the Fed going into the meeting uh, later this month? Oh, they're going to increase rates. I mean, look, uh, the, the forecast yesterday was what 5 to 5.5% inflation at the end of this year, 3 to 3.5% uh, by the end of next year. That's still about the 2% limit that they have. So a Federal Reserve is going to raise rates. Um, and we're also seeing bank lending growth, bank credit growth highest in, in about 13, 14 years. So these are all inflationary things. We look at uh, food prices uh, that's increasing. Wages are increasing, so I don't see any way that uh, Federal Reserve is going to slow down. 50 basis points, maybe if we're lucky, but 75 uh, basis points is also a, a possibility. Sarihan Hatipoglu, uh, Business Environment Risk Intelligence CEO. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. Well, let's take a look at one of our trending tickers, shares of Roku. Seeing a bit of a reversal here. We saw down uh, significantly earlier today on another downgrade from Wall Street as investors continue to fret over profitability concerns, but you see it's now up about eight tenths of a percent. The latest coming from KeyBank analyst and longtime bull Justin Patterson, who downgraded the stock from overweight to sector weight, noting that Roku is seeding market share, and in his words, greater tech debt in its ad tech stack than previously thought. Now, he added that Roku offers limited upside given lower revenue and EBITDA growth. The decline today come just week after Roku announced it would lay off 200 employees to cut costs. Five Wall Street firms have downgraded Roku stock in the last month. Well, coming up is the collapse in home prices as imminent as some experts say. Goldman Sachs seems to think so. It has flashed its outlook for next year. We're going to check in with the latest data from Kay Schiller on the other side.
U.S. home prices now posting a third consecutive monthly decline, with mortgage rates doubling in 10 months. This according to the S&P CoreLogic K. Schiller National Home Price Index. Well, for more on what's leading the decline, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Danny Romero. So, Danny, what is the expectation now? Will home prices continue to fall? Uh, yes, Rochelle, home prices are expected to decline as we enter, you know, these winter months. But on the flip side of this is that as mortgage rates are above 6%, we could, um, most of these buyers will still have to drive a really hard bargain in order to find value uh, during this time of year. Now, if we take a look at the home prices this month, the S&P CoreLogic Case Shiller National Home Index, which measures the average home prices in major metropolitan areas across the country, fell 1% in September from August. This is, like you said, the third consecutive monthly decline. And on a year to year basis, the index rose 10.6% in September. That is down from August's increase of 12.9%. But many economists are still forecasting that home prices will fall as we go into 2020. Three, but in this same report, if we're looking at the certain metropolitan areas, specifically on the West Coast, the area that suffered the biggest monthly price decline um, was on the West Coast. Um, both home prices in San Francisco and Seattle fell in September. And this all goes back to the rapid surge in mortgage rates that we saw that really struck home affordability, pushing many buyers out of the market. Now, even though demand has plummeted, home prices have continued to decline, um, but not as much, all due to the fact of supply. Supply still remains uh, an issue. But again, you know, many, um, you know, experts that I've spoken to say that, you know, borrowing costs, if borrowing costs do not stabilize uh, by early next year, we could see the scale finally tip and home prices could plummet. Goodness, I know that's a crash. Everyone will be keeping an eye on. Great update there. Danny Romero, thank you so much. All right, well, Black Friday and Cyber Monday has come, have come and gone, but opening up the holiday buying season with stronger than expected results, according to data from Adobe Analytics. But while retailers are banking on a boost from holidays, according to predictions from the NRF, can they keep up with rising demand? Well, for more, let's bring in Ina Kuznetsova, Tools Group's CEO. Thank you so much for joining us, Ina. So first of all, as we saw there, Cyber Monday, even outpacing what we saw with Black Friday. How would, what's your big takeaway from this holiday shopping season? Rachel, thank you for inviting me. Uh, we indeed saw strong sales uh, during the Cyber Monday and Black Friday, especially in such categories as electronics and home goods. And the issue everyone discussed today is, does retail face a revenue problem? And what we see at the same time is the strong sales is retail does not have a revenue problem currently, but retail has the inventory problem and profitability problem. Over the last couple of years, the massive disruptions in shipping led to huge, huge increases in inventory. And in many cases, that inventory was the wrong inventory. The consumer demand changes very, very fast driven by inflation. And as a result, we see retailers sometimes stocking on wrong products and then having to discount them very, very highly, especially during the sales events. So to, to what extent has that inventory cleared as a result of the discounts that we saw over the weekend? I mean, I, I would tell you personally, it didn't seem like we saw the steep discounts that we typically would on a Black Friday weekend, given that some of the sales started so early. We indeed saw a lot of retailers starting the discount period very early, as early as October, well before Thanksgiving, in an attempt to clear the inventory as well as ease the pressure on consumers. Um, the high interest rates still hang over consumers' head. We can still expect the changes in demand happening very, very fast based on the credit card debt and consumers are in a rush to buy at high discounts, but so are retailers trying to clean up inventory. Uh, just an example, uh, Levi's showed almost 7% growth in revenue in the third quarter, and yet they also showed 
43% growth in inventory, which led to a 20 uh, million um, uh, profitability problem, right? So we do see the need for the retailers to start planning in a much more careful way of what to stock up. And in many cases, we saw the goods that had problems with availability during the previous cycle, such as electronics, being overordered and now trying, retailers are trying to get them up. So, you know, let's talk solutions then, because obviously some, some retailers are managing better than others. And you talk about perhaps AI planning being the way, but what are some of the pros and cons of that? I think the major advantage of uh, artificial intelligence planning is that it takes new risks into an account daily. We see risks changes every, every day, a new lockdowns in China, changes in shipping rates up and down, uh, mostly down for the last months, but a potential railway strike or another lockdown in China can throw things in havoc. Changes like in consumer demand with people staying at home more, even though many are returning to the office, changing their consumption habits. Inflation uh, really pressing the consumer's buying behavior towards cheaper products. All those risks exist, and they are exacerbated by sourcing risks created by geopolitical environments in Ukraine and Thailand. So every day there is a change in the market environment. And artificial intelligence captures those changes every day, captures things that may not be even visible to a human. Uh, of course, the downside is you have to use the proven models because something very right. new and untested may only exacerbate the problem uh, that the company has with an inventory. So it's very important to look at the experience of the solution providers delivering such uh, software and uh, the business results uh, in the similar subsegments and similar industries. Certainly only as strong as the weakest link in your supply chain. A big thank you, Ina Kuznetsova, Tools Group CEO. Thank you for joining us this morning. All right, coming up to the moon. Well, space for sure. Ever wondered how human beings live and work in the final frontier? Well, Amazon's AWS has. So how important is the cloud in the great beyond? Tune in next.
Well, Amazon is taking its cloud services to new heights. This is the cloud computing giant announced today. It is successfully running compute and machine learning services in space. Joining me now to discuss the program is AWS Worldwide Public Sector VP, Max Peterson. We've also got our very own tech editor, Dan Halley, joining in on the conversation. Max, this is the first time AWS has operated a suite of these services directly onboarding an orbiting satellite. Talk to me about how this uh, is in line with that larger goal of being able to process the data in space in a more efficient manner. Uh, yes, good morning, thanks for having me. Well, I tell you what, it is really exciting because it is the first time ever that AWS has now been running machine learning mod modules and analytics on board an orbiting satellite. In fact, we've been doing it for 10 months with our partners, Dorbit and Unibap. And the reason that it is important is because you collect massive amounts of data and what you need to do is turn it into insights. So an average satellite will collect a hundred terabytes of data in a day, about 20,000 high def movies. And the challenge is how do you get all that information analyzed and down to the earth in a way that lets you take action. So with AWS's on orbit machine learning models, it reduces the image sizes by about 42%, allowing the information to be communicated to the ground faster and it can actually do image recognition right on board the satellite, being able to detect cloud cover or wildfire smoke. Max, what is this kind of you know purpose for for this kind of uh, capability? You know, what businesses, what what organizations would traditionally want something like this? That's a great question. You no, know, it's really exciting right now because we're seeing an explosion in commercial space operations. Of over 10,000 different firms right now are trying to innovate to deliver new capability and new insights from space. So this ability to do the data processing on board the satellite is essential. And examples would be earth observation for the purpose of disaster response and disaster preparedness. Imagine that you can train the model to detect fire or smoke or uh, weather patterns. Now you can do the analysis right in space using the machine learning capability and then take action faster. Um, it'll be useful for deforestation and sustainability. It'll be useful for uh, migration and disrupted populations. I think the number of things that we can do are just uh, infinitesimal. And so then when you think about perhaps some of these public uh, services, governments, et cetera, who want to use these services, any concern about how they might be using this data? Well, right now, the opportunities to be, um, uh, uh, use the satellite information, satellite data, as many people have seen, is incredible for transparency. Um, and so you're able to be able to take images and understand uh, where ships are moving across the ocean. You're able to take a look at where um, uh, land formations are or disaster uh, events are occurring. So I think the opportunity is really uh, to be able to use uh, space in so many ways to improve life here on earth. Max, can you tell us a little bit about what, what some of the complications were of getting this to work? Obviously, you know, you're running a computer in space and it's uh, taking kind of orders from uh, there. What, what does it mean for uh, the company to be able to, to do that in such a harsh environment? Yeah, at AWS, we love uh, pushing the boundaries, experimenting and innovating. And in this particular case, um, it took a lot of work with our uh, a space qualified uh, hardware pr provider, Unibap, um, to be able to install the AWS uh, machine learning models and the IOT green grass components on the space processor. Then of course we had to work with Dorbit. They launched this uh, into space. Um, this was in January of this year. We immediately contacted the, uh, the AWS component on the satellite, verified that it was live. And then over the course of the next 10 months, started doing the experimentation with the uh, image analysis, with the image compression uh, and with the various analytics. And the cool thing is we can continue to train new models with massive amounts of data on earth in the AWS cloud. And then you just upload the model to do the inference in space. It's very efficient. Um, it drives tremendous cost savings and it drives incredible speed. Um, Max, you've already got a, a 
a pretty robust footprint on Earth, right, when it comes to AWS. I mean, to what extent does this sort of represent the, the growth prospects that you see? I mean, how significant, when you talk about processing all this data out of space, where does that fit into to the larger AWS future? Yeah, the, you're absolutely right. The footprint on the ground now encompasses more than, or encompasses 30 AWS cloud computing regions, a tremendous amount of capability on the ground. Many of those regions have ground stations, satellite antennas that now can be used on a pay per use basis by any provider to be able to get that information from space down to earth and be able to get models and other information back up to the satellite. And so it has become more important now than ever that the cloud reaches out to the very edge of work that people are doing. So the very edge of processing data in space or the very edge of high speed telecommunications networks. Um, so AWS is continuing to push the boundaries of cloud computing as far out and as close to the work as possible. Certainly a huge milestone for AWS. It's good to have you on to discuss this. AWS Worldwide Public Sector VP Max Peterson, and our thanks to Yahoo Finance Tech Editor Dan Halley as well. Well, coming up, we are heading over to Capitol Hill as more dominoes fall in the wake of FTX's collapse. We speak with a member of the House Financial Services Committee on how we got here and how to prevent another collapse. That discussion is coming up. Now to Capitol Hill, and the Senate is set to vote on the final passage of a bipartisan bill protecting same-sex and interracial marriage. Joining us now from Washington, D.C. is Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schonberger. So, Jen, what can we expect here? Good morning, Rochelle. The Senate poised to vote on legislation that seeks to codify same-sex marriage into law. Uh, this coming after lawmakers' concerns that the high court could overturn its landmark decision in 2015. 
Uh, this coming, of course, after the high court overturned Roe v. Wade, sparking fears that uh, same-sex marriage rights could be taken away as well. Now, 12 Republican senators have joined with Democrats in the upper house where this bill is expected to pass. From there, it will head to the House, which is still controlled by Democrats in this lame duck session, where it is also expected to pass. From there, President Biden has pledged to sign this legislation as soon as later this week. All right, great stuff. Thank you, Jen Schonberger there reporting for us. Well, the fallout from the FTX collapse continues with crypto lender BlockFi filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection yesterday. As we take a look here, we can see that a Senate hearing looking into the spectacular failure of FTX is slated for Thursday. It'll be followed by one in the House on December 13th. And it comes as a raft of questions remain unanswered over how such a downfall could occur. Well, we're happy to be joined by Representative Ed Perlmutter from Colorado's 7th Congressional District. He sits on the House Financial Services Committee and is chair of the Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions Subcommittee. Thank you for joining us today. I want to first start by getting your take on FTX. A lot of people were wondering, was there anything in terms of existing laws on the books that could have prevented what we saw with FTX? Well, there are plenty of laws on the books, uh, but as uh, crypto gained uh, momentum over the years, um, you know, FTX and, and other companies were always sort of basing their projections on crypto, Bitcoin, all increasing. And the minute that the Fed started raising interest rates and people started questioning the, the value of the crypto they had, when it started dropping, uh, dominoes started falling and uh, FTX and BlockFi now are just the latest dominoes to fall. But we've had a whole bunch over the last nine months. Uh, let me ask the question more directly, though, because there are certainly a lot of fingers that have been pointed at lawmakers to say, well, because lawmakers as well as regulators were so slow to act in the U.S., that pushed a lot of the activity offshore. So well, did the inaction by lawmakers contribute to the collapse that we've seen in crypto? No, I think, uh, Akiko, I was a bankruptcy lawyer for a very long time before I got elected to Congress. And, you know, this was a house of cards. And whether it was in the United States or elsewhere, if it's a house of cards and you're getting money from investors based on the come, based on everything keep, that keeps going up, and then the, when it stops going up, all of a sudden the house of cards falls apart. And, you know, I, I know there are a lot of uh, crypto adherents, a lot of supporters, but the, the underlying technology, the blockchain technology is very valuable, but the pro, some of these cryptocurrencies and coins and things like that, you know, you just change one little algorithm, you know, numeral and you got a whole new coin. So um, no, I think that uh, we've got plenty of laws on the books about uh, investments and fraud and Ponzi schemes and, you know, that's what it is. There's plenty of bills that have been put forward around regulation. You know, some would argue that Sam Bankman-Fried was had a big hand in it, um, given that he was a, a constant presence on Capitol Hill. He did contribute to Democratic lawmakers, as well as some Republican ones, too. So when you think of about what has been laid out before, I mean, does this set you back at zero, given that some of these bills were favorable to FTX? Or is this something that that's already been on the books that you think you can work with to prevent something like this in the future? Well, that's a good question. I think that there are plenty of laws on the books to deal with, you know, investments where, you know, it was based on just everything's going up, uh, not the real risk of it all falling apart. And so I think there's laws, you know, from uh, the Securities Act of 1934, you know, various investment acts as well. It's just basic common law of, you know, deceiving people and, you know, uh, taking some money and commingling it with other money. And that's what we seem to see happening here. So there's a lot of laws on the books. Now, whether there was something that could have been done to stop this earlier, that's a good question. But you could, you know, I guess from my background as a bankruptcy lawyer out of Denver, Colorado, where we saw this kind of stuff in the 80s and the 90s, you know, with penny stocks and some other things, 
Um, it's not surprising. I wish it didn't happen. A lot of people are going to get hurt. Uh, but, you know, the, the problem is that everything was bet on crypto increasing in value. And the minute those rates changed, everybody, whether it's real estate or everything else, starts dropping. And then, you know, it's musical chairs and who can get out the fastest. And I want to ask you now about another sector, which is um, marijuana and the Safe Banking Act. You're going to be retiring. What are your expectations for what you could potentially get done before you leave and where the holdup is, where the sticking points still are? Well, Rochelle, I'm glad you're asking the question, not Akiko, because uh, she's asked me that before, and I'm the <laughs> eternal optimist. And But I'm also a realist, uh, Akiko. I've become a realist in this. And the, the optimist says we're going to get it done. There are several uh, ways we can do it through the National Defense Authorization Act, through a standalone bill that's sitting over in the Senate, or through one of the um, funding bills, the um, various appropriations bills we have. But the realist in me says I've been disappointed before and the industry has been disappointed before because it's gotten stuck in the Senate and time is short. But I think given the activity in the Senate that we've seen over the course of the last month, uh, both out of the banking committee as well as out of the majority leader's office, uh, I think something's going to happen and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that it does, at least on the House side. Yeah, you know, Congressman, I, I was counting how many times it has passed the House earlier. How many times you've been behind that? How many times we've had you on? Seven times it has passed before. As you point out, there's a financial services element of it, but then the criminal justice reform, too. I mean, can you bring those two together before you depart D.C.? I think so. So there, um, some of the senators have wanted to see additional uh, criminal justice equity reforms. And I think there is a way to what we called safe banking plus. And that would uh, have some expungement of records for minor infractions for low level violations, uh, coupled with some uh, work with the, the Veterans Administration, maybe a pilot program dealing with PTSD, uh, some research components. So there's there are a way to fashion this that I think brings keeps Republicans in the Senate. Uh, we need 10 at least, uh, I think, to pass it out of the Senate with the Democrats and move it back to the House, where I know we could pass it and send it on to President Biden. OK, well, we'll be watching very closely. We'll have to have you back on one last time if it doesn't uh, you know what? pass. <laughs> have me back on when we pass this darn thing, and then my optimism will you know, have come to fruition. We'll see. <laughs> okay, it's always good to have you on. Representative Ed Perlmutter from Colorado, 7th Congressional District. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Well, coming up on the other side, New Balance has long been known for pulling in some big celebrity advocates, but it's still being endorsed by the high street. We bring in president or resident sneakerhead Brad Smith to ask the key questions. He's going to have that interview for us on the other side.
Well, Black Friday and Cyber Monday may be behind us, but the holiday shopping season just beginning. For more on the holiday shopping trends and habits, get over Yahoo Finance's Brad Smith. Can we call you a resident sneakerhead? Standing by with <laughs> a special guest, New Balance CEO Joe Preston. Yes, I, I, I will take the title for now, Akiko. I appreciate that. And thanks for teeing up the conversation. Yes, joining us here on set, we've got the CEO of New Balance, Joe Preston. Joe, thanks so much for joining us in studio here. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate Absolutely. This is, this is a big time of the year for you guys because there is so much that we're tracking on the inventory trends, on just what the hot topics and hot items are that are moving off of shelves. For New Balance, what are you seeing right now currently in this holiday kind of sell-through period as, as compared to years past? Yeah. Well, we've had a really strong year. We had a record Q3, and that's given us great momentum as we head into the holiday season. So Black Friday and... And uh, over the weekend, we had really strong volume mm -hmm. on our website, newbalance.com, as well as through our own stores and our partner stores. So we feel really confident that we're going to continue to have that momentum. The search for our brand has been up significantly all year, which is a pretty good indicator of interest. And it's happening here and around the world. Now, let's talk about some of the categories and what's, what's doing really well for you right now. Because a, a lot of people, like myself, I, I grew up and I had to have a pair of the classic New Balance grays just on stock in the closet at any time because they go with any fit. But now you've got basketball, you've got tennis, you've got skateboarding, you still have the running category. Where are you seeing the outperformance and where customers are gravitating towards? We're, we're attracting a younger consumer. And those younger consumers are coming in to our brand, and they're really coming across our categories. But running is at our core. Mm -hmm. Our classic product, products that we introduced many years ago, the 990 was the first $100 running shoe was introduced in 1982, which just celebrated its 40th anniversary with the introduction of the V6. But our entry back into basketball with the signing of Kawhi Leonard the past you know, three or four years ago has given us great energy in that category, and that's transcending across uh, multiple categories as well. Big claw energy with Kawhi for sure there. Uh, when we think about those categories and additionally pricing strategy right now too, we've seen and heard so much in retail about pricing being passed through to consumers. What's the strategy been over at New Balance, especially when you look across the landscape when it comes to the sneaker category right now? Well, we've tried to be selective. So we have tried to pass along some of the costs that we've been absorbing, whether through labor or through logistics. And, uh, and other elements of that. And so uh, as we come into the holiday season, you know, we also, there's also inventory in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. that we have inventory and our retailers have inventory and we're trying to be selective about where we're promoting. So some of our product is on sale if we have more heavy inventory and there's other product that is holding price. Does that mean you're pulling back some inventory from some of the historical retailers that you would have worked to, especially in a more direct to consumer environment right now? Uh, no, the answer to that is no. But being direct to consumer through our stores and online is allowing us to get closer to the consumer. Yep. That is absolutely imperative on our behalf. We think it's a big reason for our brand momentum, and we think it makes us a better partner for our wholesale partners. We were talking a little bit before our discussion here about the resale market and how crazy things have gotten. I mean, you go in any of the stores or on the online capacity, and you could see a New Balance shoe reselling for double, maybe triple, what it's going for in retail. You know, as you kind of survey the resale environment right now, what comes to your mind, and, and how does that really shift the strategy over at New Balance, too? Well, there's probably two parts to it. One of them is when we have a drop, we want to make sure that product is getting to actual consumers and making sure that individual bots and those type of things are not are not breaking through, if you will. But when you see product being resold, secondary market, it is an indicator of your brand health. Mm -hmm. It is an indicator of the amount of supply and demand that you have for a particular model, and we do watch it. Some other companies in this landscape, uh, Nike particularly, they've gone as far as to kind of set in some curbs for resellers when they recognize bots or when they recognize that they're having high restocking. Is that something that New Balance has had to consider as well? We've definitely brought in technology to allow us to uh, combat the bots. Mm. Interesting. And then just lastly here while we've got you, uh, look, I, I know you are wearing some of the uh, overseas produced. Uh, walk us through the, the model that you've got on right now. What's really selling this holiday season too? Yeah. What are you seeing going on? So I'm on? wearing a model for, that's made in the UK. We're the only okay. athletic uh, manufacturer that has uh, facilities in the UK. 
We're also the only athletic manufacturer that has facilities here in the U.S. Mm. We have three factories in Maine. We have two in Massachusetts in the Made in USA component of our, which is a small portion of our overall volume is really important to us because it is about craftsmanship. It allows us to also get closer to the consumer. They're just super comfortable, man. I mean, my goodness, every time, every time I put them on, Joe, honestly, uh, it's a really comfortable shoe. You guys have been doing really great work and excelling into some of those new categories as well in the sneaker game. We appreciate you taking the time here on set. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's Joe Preston, the New Balance CEO. And Kiko, I'll toss things back on over to you. We didn't get a chance to see Joe's sneakers. You have to send us a, a photo later. <laughs> yes, we'll do. <laughs> All right, Brad Smith with that interview. Thanks so much for that. Well, coming up on the other side, GM's president has a lot of people talking when he outlined just how many Teslas the group services centers are actually fixing. The question is, shouldn't Tesla be doing that? We've got more on some of those Musk problems on the other Many Tesla owners are turning to General Motors to service their vehicles as frustration with Tesla's complex repair network continues to mount. Now, Akiko, you know something about this, right? I'm, I'm a potential EV owner for one day, but you're living this right now. Yeah, I have been driving a Tesla for the last month, and it is difficult to get any kind of question answered, getting to service centers when I'm in. I'm in California, obviously, where there is a significant network. But uh, let's talk about what GM has said. I mean, 11,000 cars is what they've reportedly repaired so far. We heard that from GM's president, Mark Roos, in this investor presentation he gave last week. And Rochelle, you know, this really points to the inherent difference that we have seen in the business models of these companies. You've got the traditional car companies that operate with a ne network of dealerships that they don't directly own. But that means, this is according to one stat that I saw, that GM service centers, Americans are within 10 miles of a service center for GM as opposed to Tesla, where they do directly own the service centers as well as the sales centers. But that means there's not as many. And in some states, they don't necessarily operate. So, you know, this is just anecdotal. I will say that as a car, Tesla is has been good so far in the last month for me to drive, save a lot on gas. But it is frustrating when you can't get to a service center because it's not as accessible. I bet. And looking at the notes that we heard um, from the president of GM, he, he said they're mostly coming to GM for collision repair, routine maintenance, brakes, tires. The, these are the essentials. And GM has gotten smart to this in their service centers. They're now adding charging stations as well. So, you know, getting getting a little more into the game here, all thanks to Tesla. Go figure. Well, and you have to wonder how much 
you know, brand loyalty gets built in as a result of that, right? That's kind of what GM is hoping that you get Tesla drivers in, GM helps them out. Maybe that next car isn't necessarily a Tesla, but a GM. There you go. Well, we'll have to leave it there with our, with our EV shopping stories. I'm Rochelle Akufa with Akiko Fujita. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow at 11 Eastern.